This episode brought to you by How to Write Manga, your complete guide to the secrets of Japanese comic book storytelling. Available wherever fine ebooks are sold. The world has gone insane. Cosplayers rule the conventions, gamers dominate the tabletop, and the internet. Sci fi subjugates the movies. And fantasy rules the bookstore with an iron fist. Only one group can bring order to this unruly mob. A team of uber geeks, masters of the nerdly arts, trained for decades in the hobby shops and basements of the nation. Mobilized by the secret masters, they are the Department of Nerdly Affairs. Hello, operatives, and welcome to the Department of Nerdly Affairs. I'm your host, Rob Patterson, here with my co-host, Don Chisholm. (laughs) Who's been taking his happy pills again. And tonight, we're going to be discussing writing. Specifically, plotting formulas and how to put together a good story. That's probably why Don's been taking his happy pills, because it's quite a complicated and crazy subject when you really get into it. (laughs) But I think probably the best place to start, and I imagine Don will agree, is to discuss the most basic writing formula of them all, the three-act structure. The three-act structure was first posited in, give or take, about 320 BC. Yes, it's really that old. It first appeared in a book uh, called Poetics by a man named Aristotle, one of those uh, old dead dudes who wrote a whole lot of stuff back in the Greek days. In his book, Poetics, Aristotle describes an incline that a plot should have. Uh, Poetics itself, despite the title, is basically the very first manual we know of storytelling and script writing. And the three-act structure is kind of a development based on that. The structure itself is actually very simple. You have a beginning, a middle, and an end. I know. Genius, right? (laughs) Um, Somewhere in there... During the beginning, you introduce your character and the situation and everything that's going to happen to them. Then you get to the middle, where the character is usually involved in a new world or new situation of some kind. They're thrust basically into the main plot, and that's what starts the second act. The second act is the longest act, usually double the length of the introduction and the conclusion. And the character during the second act will usually go through... The situation, they'll try to solve their problems a few different ways, usually will fail a couple times, and then eventually they'll get it right. Or so they think, which is usually about the middle of the story. The character will usually then start to do worse. You know, their their lives will start to go downhill or uphill, depending if they had a bad middle. And then what will happen is their life will fall apart, usually just before the third act starts. The beginning of the third act starts with them having to pick themselves up off the ground... And then fight the antagonist or fight whatever the situation is, solve the main problem, and finally walk off into the sunset. A newly minted, successful, transformed hero of some kind or another. Hmm. At least according to the hero's journey theory, which I've kind of mixed in there into the three-act structure, but that's the most common version of it that we use today. So that's why. Right. Right. Any comments, Don? Yeah, see, that's kind of, it's a good place to start. Because um, I think a lot of people don't realize that almost from entertainment's beginning, there were attempts to kind of codify exactly how does this thing work. Mm-hmm. And that's your basic. And it's interesting because you can see that, that the, the three-act story is still in use today. Oh, yeah. It's absolutely uh, still in use today. It's Hollywood standard. Not just Hollywood. Um, especially, say, television. Television mm. is big. Big yeah. on that. I should note that there are many variants of the, of the three-act structure. Uh, one of the most common ones, and we'll probably mention it a few times today, is the four-act structure. Mm-hmm. The four-act structure is basically the three-act structure with the middle, act three, cut in half. Yeah. That's basically what it is. With the midpoint, which I mentioned already, is usually either a false victory or false defeat. They think they've won or they think they've lost. And then it kind of goes from there. That's the point where the act changes between act two and act three 
if you're using yeah. a four-act structure. There's also the five-act structure, which again is the three-act structure broken down into different versions, and it go- goes on from there. They're all basically right. versions of the three-act structure. I've even seen nine-act structure, 12-act. <laughs> I've even seen an 18-act structure. They do exist. Wow. See, that's kind of... It's it's interesting to look at that, because mm-hmm. uh, doing a little research for this, mm-hmm. you start to see... Um, when a formula like that becomes popular and, and gets used, you have to kind of ask that question. Um, is the formula merely reflecting what's happening in the, the, the works being produced? Or is it actually shaping the works being produced? I think it's a little of both. Um, yeah. Well, you got to remember, the three-act structure comes from the fact that we, of course, are temporal beings. We have beginnings, middles, and ends. Yeah. And we view the world in that way. Yeah. And so because of that, that's where the three-act structure, I think, comes naturally from. You have the beginning of the story, you have the middle, the end. And we think of it that way just naturally because that's the way our lives work. And right. that's it's the a- way the world works to us. Yeah, it's also interesting, just as kind of a weird aside when you mention that. Mm-hmm. Um, two points. Number one is, for human psychology, the magic numbers are three, five, and seven. Those, those being numbers that our brain tends to group things into. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing that's interesting that kind of goes to what I was getting at of how much does it influence things is we tend to see the world in terms of a story. Mm-hmm. We like we seem, we seem to see real life events in terms of a story. And that's why you get, say, so many people who are just waiting with bated breath for the end of the world because... They're waiting to see the end. They're waiting to see the end to the story that is the human race. Yes, that's true. The end and within it, their lifetime. Because otherwise, if the world doesn't end during their time, that means their lives were just part of the middle and were largely irrelevant. Well, and that they weren't the protagonist. I, that's probably even closer to the truth. I mean, we well, can all be relevant without being you know, there at the end, but you're right, we're not the protagonist. I mean, we all tend to think of ourselves as the beginning, middle, and end of the world because that's how we see the world. That's how we are. Right. So I don't think that's necessarily bad. I think that's just natural. That's the nature of being human. It could be because you see some philosophers from Mm -hmm. way, way back when that didn't necessarily see a beginning and an end. It was just things just were. Right. And... Part of me always wonders if because, say, that the the, the three-act formula Mm -hmm. for for a story became the prevalent one, Mm -hmm. again, did that affect, like, um, Western culture takes a lot of its its base inspiration from, like, the ancient Greek philosophers and that. Right. Did we somehow take that theory of entertainment and work that into every aspect of everything that we've thought since? That's an interesting question. Um, The only thing that makes me suspect that you're correct is that I have heard of other structures. In fact, I've even seen one. The Japanese have the Kisho Tenketsu structure, which is sometimes referred to as the non-conflict storytelling structure, where two things come together and there's a kind of a meeting of those two things and something new results. Right. And unlike our Western style of structure, which where where someone's kind of like rolling a rock uphill or they're pushing against things, this is about just two things meeting and naturally producing a new result by the very meeting of two things. Right. And I'm not sure... Well, but there's still a beginning, middle, and end there. There's still two things exist, two things come together... And then eventually we get a result out of that. So that's still beginning and middle and end, though. I've heard that there's actually a Aztec structure, a structure, I think it's from the Aztecs or the Mayans, that uh-huh. I've heard of, that's a circular story-based structure. But right. then again, even there, you can kind of look at it as, well, it's still beginning, middle, and end. I mean, the circle comes back around, right? Right. So maybe the answer is, no matter what culture it is, because of just the very nature of human existence, stories have beginning, middles, and ends. It could be, though, but it's getting to the to that idea of, of it's a circle. 
That's mm. not a concept when you think of the cosmos that you see a lot in, in Western thinking. You see that in, say, Eastern thinking, the idea that, say, of reincarnation, that when we die, we come back and try it again. Mm -hmm. That everything's whereas, a cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas when you look at, like, Western, uh, like, religions and such, mm -hmm. the theory is when you die, you go somewhere for your final reward. Right. And most of them have built in this idea that at some point, God, God's the primordial force, whatever you want to call it, is going to return and do something, and that's going to be the final chapter of the story. Yeah. And everyone thinks that they're going to be there for the final chapter, as you pointed out. Mm. Um, well, not everyone, but, you know, many hardcore Christians do, and a few other religions as well. Um, Cause that's your the, point. Yeah, cause, yeah, you're right. Because that's the idea, if you go back to, say, the Aztecs, mm -hmm. um, they didn't necessarily see an end. They saw the potential for it, but the idea was that by doing your the the rituals and and feeding the gods mm -hmm. that you perpetuated the things mm, very true that if you stop doing that the universe falls apart but it was kind of this idea that there was no planned ending that as mm. long as you kept doing this things which it kind of comes back to something um more of an ecology mm, true yeah which, that um, makes sense yeah because that goes um to to tie this into the scientific world Mm -hmm. Um, I think of that article that I read a while ago that pointed out that even the concept of evolution, we tend to read into it a beginning, middle and end because we seem to think or not seem to think the idea sort of subconsciously perpetuates that organisms are evolving towards increased complexity. Mm, true. And that's not how it works because there's a lot more bacteria now. Hmm than than there were because they evolve too. It's that you get different circumstances, causes you different strains. Mm -hmm. And they showed it because they said if you look at um uh pictures of prehistoric times like dinosaur books and that. Right. You'll you'll see when you go back to like the to the, the era of era of lizards, like when Dimetrodons roamed the earth, you'll mm -hmm. see all kinds of insects and swamps and that. Mm -hmm. When you get to the dinosaur era, nobody puts insects in the picture. Why not? Well, they were there, but we've got this idea that insects are basically relegated to a certain era. Oh, okay, I see your point. Yeah. yeah. So, they were, that was the insect era, and now this is the era of the cool big lizards. Yeah, because they've they're more complex. They've evolved to this more complex thing. So now you don't see any of the, like the lesser things, even though they're still there. They were still very much there. Wow. I'd never thought about that. So yeah, subconsciously, that idea is permeating every aspect of our society and even science. Wow. Right. Huh. Well, and, that, and that's what I wonder. Is it because we adopted that three-act play, the three-part story, the beginning, middle, and end is suffused into everything that we, we think, see, and do? Well, it's definitely there as part of history because... As historians will tell you, history does not actually work in a linear fashion. We, right. we think it does because we organize it that way. Or we craft a story out of history that works that way. But the truth is, history is a giant, soupy mess <laughs> that we have chosen to craft different narratives out of. Again, using that building three-act structure thing. Right. Um, so we craft the story of our nations, for example, be it Canada, China, Australia, whatever. Uh, we craft the story of our nation's birth, of our people's birth, where it came from, etc. And we kind of work their way up. Is that wrong? No, not exactly. But it probably was nowhere near as clear cut as it's shown to be. Mm -hmm. um, also, we've got the idea that, quote unquote, progress is always going forward, which right. is actually complete BS. It is not going <laughs> forward. Um, there were times in history when women had incredible rights, for example, and were very much equal in times, even potentially superior to men in certain societies, certain cultures. That never lasted long. Mm -hmm. uh, it's perhaps lasted longer now than it ever has in history, but not necessarily. Right. Um, so for things like civil rights and things like that, they come and they go. You know, right. people call the liberals who are constantly fighting for social justice and such progressives or trying to make improve society progressives but they forget that progress doesn't always go forward sometimes it goes backwards yeah well, and that's, 
and things can mutate and go in weird, weird different directions. And it's not all uh, direct line. Well, yeah, that and, and, and two, you get um, worked into that is this idea of inevitability. Yes. So it's exactly. like, oh, women got the vote. Okay, that's all taken care of. Time to move on to the next problem. When, yeah, it, it doesn't, especially any kind of like um, social decision, social activity, mm. it doesn't move in a specific direction. And once I get from A to B, B is where I'm going to be until I get to C. You can always go back. Oh, yeah. I mean, look at our current situation now. Eight years ago, when Obama was elected, everyone said, well, racism's done. It's over. Mm -hmm. We got our black president. It is now the true era of social justice. We Americans have finally evolved. We're ready to move on. You know, we're ready to engage in a post-racial, you know, post-gender, post-everything society. And that didn't quite work out so well. Not so far, anyway. Right. And well, so... I... Sorry, continue. Oh, no, 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 go ahead. And so uh, it came as a little bit of a shock when recently we got, you know, Donald Trump elected as president, mm -hmm. who doesn't believe in any of those things. Right. So American society could be heading in any number of directions at this point. Most of them probably not so good, but we'll see what happens. True. Well, because that ties into um, all of that wraps up. And you'll forgive me for not remembering who said this quote. It, I really should. But um, the yeah. old saying, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Um, people take that to mean in like the G.I. Joe sense, because some guy is going to come and take your stuff. So you got to have like a tank and fight him. Mm. But, but part of what you really have to be vigilant against is complacency, uh, laziness, mm. you know, fear, mm. the, st the stuff like internal stuff, like yep. things that on a personal level that can also affect the culture because, but people don't think of it that way because we don't have, um, well, well, again, we believe that once something happens, once we get to be, that's just how it is that you now, I don't have to take care of that. I don't have to keep feeding the gods of equality because they don't exist. It's, it's, it's not a circle. It's a line and that's mm -hmm. kind of wrong. No, it's not. Um, and so going back to your point from earlier, we do see the world in terms of stories or we craft stories or narratives as they're now referred to as, which is becoming right. one of the big buzzwords only in the last five or six years, suddenly everything became a narrative, right? which implies, <laughs> interestingly enough, that there are conflicting narratives, which maybe is actually a more accurate reflection. Yeah, it could be. Um, so, yes, so we see the, we tend to see the world in narratives, beginning, middle, and end, which the three-act structure reflects and mirrors back at us, I guess, mirrors back at our view of the world. All right, so let's take this to the next step, then. <laughs> oh, the Hyperboreans, all of their stuff is so formula. I know, right? <laughs> well, we know that Shakespeare used a five-act structure. Right. He knew what he was doing. Uh, he had basically this... Um, structure that was involved a little bit at the beginning, kind of a prelude, and then it led into a basically four-act structure, is what it is. Right. Okay. Interestingly enough, that's also the exact same formula that television used for most of its history. Right. Until recently, when television evolved into a six, and I think currently the standard is a seven-act structure. Okay. Why is it seven acts, you might ask? So you can stick more commercials in. Yeah. That's simply how they're breaking up the story and deciding where stuff goes, basically. Yeah. Which I think is one of the keys for most story formulas, is, which, which is one of the things we're going to talk about today, is that formulas are intended to be plug and play. I mean, they kind of tell you where everything goes in a rough, general kind of sense. And yeah, so that's what... Sorry, let me just finish. And that's what many writers want. That's what people want, right? You want a formula so that you can be told where you're supposed to put everything in the story to get a good story. It's kind of like a machine. You just kind of feed your bits into it and it puts out this story, right? So yeah. you can, anyone can be a great author, right? That's a scary thought. Um, yeah, but again, too, uh, you, you run into kind of the problem mm -hmm. that when one of these, these structures right. becomes dominant, it sets up expectations for the audience. So if you don't follow that structure people aren't always like pleased and they don't know why. Right. Yeah. They feel that there's something wrong with the story. They feel that sense of, uh, that something's discordant basically. Yeah. 
because there was a there was an article I read a little while ago that talked about that because they said um, mm-hmm. movies all kind of follow the same structure and timing. Yes, they do. And they, to prove it, they said take any movie fast forward to about the half hour point. That's where the first setback is always at. Yep. And they said what ends up happening is if 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 um, a viewer thinks the movie was kind of slow. Mm-hmm. It typically means those timings were off. That um, a lot of the the setup, right, or or the setbacks happened, say, ten minutes after the point that they normally would. And even though you're not aware of it, you somehow feel that somebody dropped the ball, somebody wasn't on time because subconsciously you have this timing, you have this expectation that something's going to happen and it didn't. Well, yes, um, and. There's absolutely a clear formula, a clear set of timing. I mean, in his book, Save the Cat, which is probably one of the best books on script writing you're going to read. Or worse. Or worse, depending on your perspective. (laughs) Um, But is for at least for the Hollywood formula, it's perhaps the best. Um, Blake Snyder uh, lays out, not just using a three-act structure, but he lays out exactly where everything goes to the page. He tells you exactly where all these key critical points are and what happens exactly at those critical points. Yeah. And it's pretty impressive because, yeah, he's right. I'll, I'll tell you, actually, I'll tell you a weird side story. So I have a thing up on my site, uh, which is a collection of uh, story and writing formulas. I uh, put it up recently. It's under story writing formulas. I'll have a link to it in the show notes. It's on my personal website at robinpatterson.com where I've just been collecting story writing formulas and techniques and stuff like that. At the, at the top of my, at the top of that article, there's a plot line graph that I just randomly grabbed using Google image search, just to stick at the very top. I thought it represented a fairly typical, you know, three act structure type thing. And it's at the bottom of it. You can see there's time listed. Okay, so you can actually see the time. It has the inciting incident, the turning points, and all the key Hollywood moments labeled on. It's set for one hour, 20 minutes. And so I posted this and I shared this on Reddit. Okay, and another Redditor, whose name I forget, I apologize for this, actually sat down and they were watching something and they (laughs) had this up on their screen. And so they began paying attention to whether the movie they were watching, which they didn't say which one it was, matched this plot line graph Mm. and they wrote back to me on reddit and said you know i was i did this and it all matched exactly Mm -hmm. like to the minute he was watching the plot line graph happen on his screen right (laughs) and i wrote back to him and said yep that's that sounds about right and i told him the story of back in university back when uh i first met you among other things but we weren't roommates or anything i was living in residence at the Mm -hmm. time and when I was living in residence, each day we would have lunch at the same time because that's the way our classes were. We had a one hour break for lunch from 12 to 1. And one of the local channels, I think it was Channel 20 Detroit, was showing reruns of the A Team. And they would show them every day at lunch. <laughs> and so underneath our TV, yeah, you know where this is headed. <laughs> underneath our TV, of course, was a VCR. And of course, so we had the VCR clock sitting underneath this TV as we were watching. And eventually I realized that I could literally just look at the VCR clock and tell you what was going to happen on the screen. (laughs) Because the show was following literally to the minute, like bang, 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 bang. There was such an exact formula that the A-Team followed. And you might say, oh, ha, 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 it's the A-Team, etc. But no, that applies to most stories. Most stories are following that exact pattern. If you look for them, you can see them happening over and over and over again so anyway (laughs) that's my story is that uh so that plot line graph which i happened to just randomly i didn't randomly but the plot line graph which i just stuck up at the top of my of my article there someone pointed out that yeah it's exactly how it goes and so therefore your point about people think that the timing is off that's what they mean i think that's right they've internalized what the exact timing for everything is in a story and if you don't have the right thing at the right place they don't like it They, they, they're, it's to be expected Mm -hmm. just as you have to have a certain type of ending and everything. And if you don't deliver it, the audience doesn't know what to do. They kind of freak out a little bit. Sometimes that can be a good thing. 
Usually, <laughs> however, it does not result in them coming back for more of your work. Right. Yeah. Um, even something that's meant to be as twisty as, say, an M. Night Shyamalan film back when he was kind of almost good, <laughs> um, still is following that plot line. They're still following that pattern. It's just he just put a little extra twist there at when during the uh, climactic moment to kind of twist thing around, and that's what he got known for. Yeah. But that's not new either. No, and it's the kind of thing I think um, one of the hazards – actors. there's mm-hmm. two hazards that I think with – um with relying on a lot of these like writing story formulas. Um, but mm-hmm. the big one is that it literally becomes plug and play that yep. for, for the, for the, the writer, they just will just fill in the blank. Okay. I need hero. A does that. And that's why computers one day will be writing movies. Um, well, they've already got them writing novels, but they're just not very good. Right. Not so far anyway. Yeah. Um, well, Here's the thing, right? I think there's two levels to it. One of them is is that the standard formula, the standard Hollywood formula, acts as training wheels. At least that's the theory yeah. anyway. It acts as training wheels for new writers who are coming in. It's like, this is where all this stuff goes. If you follow this, you can write a story that's good or that the audience will at least accept. Yeah. And so it lets them practice. And the theory is is that they'll eventually kind of sort of outgrow it or they'll be able to play with it or they'll be able to you know, do different things with it. It acts as a structure upon which they can work. Right. And that actually in and of itself is a good thing. I mean, it, it gives writers the confidence, just like when someone's going to ride a bike, training mm-hmm. wheels. On the other hand, it also is, as you've noted, become it's the expected formula but again that's probably because the audience also wants that i mean remember the audience wants more of the yeah. same most most of our stories are ultimately still morality plays right. they are all still stories about how the universe is a just place because good and evil face off evil always loses and therefore the viewer can smile and peacefully go to sleep that night knowing that the universe did all was right with the world and God's in his heaven and everything's okay. Right. Unless you're watching Evangelion. Yeah. Well, there was, there was there's also, um, uh, uh, I can't remember who did it. It was a psychological study that they, they realized that we like things that are familiar. Yes. We and do. this is one of the reasons why, um, like movie previews always ruin the ending. Because Mm -hmm. they found people like it better if they know how it ends. They like it better if they know what's coming up. That they they like that that familiar. And new things don't generally register, except when you're younger and your brain's full of dopamine. Yeah, the young like things that are new because the world is still new to them. But the older you get, the less you like new and the more you want just something that's going to be familiar and comforting. Yeah. Something that's become really trendy in the self-publishing world right now, just to go in with that, is a guy named Chris Fox recently wrote a book called Right to Market. Mm -hmm. And in that book, basically what he advocates is the idea that, look, the audience just wants the same old stuff, Mm -hmm. okay? They just want what they more of what they like, just told to them in a slightly different way. So he said the best way to become a successful self-published writer or independent writer, however you want to describe them, at this point is to pick a genre that is reasonably hot, Mm -hmm. go in, if you don't already, hopefully it's one you already know, but it doesn't matter, go in, learn the tropes, in other words, learn what the standards are, what the audience expects for that genre, and then write a book using that. Use Use the formula they expect, use the tropes they expect, and then publish that. And generally speaking, most people who do this succeed. Yeah. It really is that simple. He actually pointed this out. A lot of people decried him saying, you've just ruined you know, publishing. You've just ruined <laughs> writing. You're an evil, evil human being. Because you've just said that you know, people want formula. They want more of the same. And no, no, people want original work. People want something different and stimulating in that. Those are all, of course, the people writing literary fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> the people writing genre fiction, which is what he's talking about, many of them said, hey, that's, that's re- you're right. And so... As an end result, what we start to see, he only put this out like less than a year ago. Right. A year ago, give or take. What's already happening is, is that any time a genre starts to get hot, and we, we're going through several different genres right now that are getting hot, besides romance. <laughs> romance is always No, it's hot. not romance. It's um, porn. It's pick a noun, put porn at the end, go to town. <laughs> 
Okay, well, anyway, erotica. Sorry. Okay. Um, now that now that besides erotica, which is always popular and always hot, of course, um, what we've started to see is is that because this is, Chris Fox also suggests this. He says, look at whatever the standard cover is for that genre, and make sure your cover matches all the tropes for the cover right. too. So, for an example, in his book, he gives space opera. He says he noted that. He looked at all these popular space opera books and he said they're all about like a uh, an old ship and a slightly roguish, worn down captain. And they all have like a big spaceship on the cover. Oh, facing, facing, fighting some you know alien menace or whatever. And they all have a big spaceship on the cover and such. So he said, this is what I chose to write. He actually went out and wrote books based on that and had a fair amount of success writing them. He actually, no, he succeeded. He proved he could do it by actually doing it, not just theory. Mm-hmm. Maybe he, he wasn't a, exactly a bestseller, but he did, he actually sold a fair amount and he, it worked. Right. Well, guess what? Now the entire space <laughs> opera genre is all pe- is all books with big spaceships on the cover and about grizzled captains doing this, this, this and the other thing. Because <laughs> instead of looking for other genres, everyone copied the one that he found was hot. Yeah. Um, now, mind you, space opera and in general sci-fi is actually a really hot genre right now. It actually still right. is. Like basically anybody and their brother can or sister can publish anything in the space opera genre and they'll sell copies right. at this point. Not a lot of copies, but we're kind of going through a sci-fi phase at the moment, yeah. so that's not a surprise. But I've noticed that's starting to happen in other genres too, where I'm seeing that if you pick a genre and you look at the covers, the covers are all almost identical to each other now. Right. Because people are like, well, people want more of the same. Well, that includes the cover. So we'll just give them more of the same cover. And if I'm sure if I went into the story, I'd find most of the stories <laughs> are identical too. Yeah. I, I think to his detractors, I would have to say, have you not heard of the pulp era? This is true. Mm-hmm. The, the pulp era was all about churning out stories. But then again, keep in mind at that time, the pulps were effectively television, yeah. right? I mean, Oh yes, there was radio, which was maybe closer to TV and structure, but the pulps were basically people putting out ad- generic, fairly shallow adventure stories and romance stories and detective stories and stories about everything under mm-hmm. the sun in weekly, bi-weekly or monthly magazines and just feeding an audience that wanted more and more of this stuff because that's all they had was radio and pul- the pulps. Yeah, but I mean, nowadays you get that effect from the opposite direction, I think, because on the internet... Mm-hmm. You have unlimited choice, so you tend to just gravitate towards what you already know. This is true. Or stuff that's similar to what you already yeah. know. And I th- and I think that's kind of really what Chris Fox was actually really driving for, at least I'd like to think <laughs> he was, which is write something that isn't exactly the formula, but is close enough to it that the audience is going to, it's going to resonate with the audience of your choice. Right. Right. The people are buying hot books in this area because that's what they want more of. I mean, if you're writing urban fantasy, you're going to be writing about, well, let's be honest, Buffy the Vampire Slayer or some variant thereof. I mean, that's that's what they all are. They're about a kick ass female lead who gets involved with some like supernatural beastie boy or girl as the case may be. Mm-hmm. And um, they, you know, they have like a weird romance. And at the same time, you know, they kick monster butts and hide demons or whatever or caterpillars or whatever the monster is of the <laughs> right. week. And, um, and maybe there's some magic involved and stuff like that. And they're all variants thereof. Yeah. They really are. I mean, and the genre is flooded with them and guess what? They sell like hotcakes. Yeah. They still sell like hotcakes. Yeah. Vampires still sell. Twilight is still mm-hmm. selling. I mean, Twilight's a tiny bit different than what I was than Buffy on the surface. But if you actually think about it, it's actually very similar. Well, yeah, no, I would, um, I would argue that you've kind of, demonstrated the my next point oh yeah. okay thank you thank you very much that you usually what happens and we've talked about this before about the next big thing and and that any anytime mm-hmm. something takes off there's usually a progenitor there's something that came out that made all the money mm-hmm. now everybody copies it because right. my argument would be like say twilight isn't um it, it's not buffy okay it's it's Anne rice for 14 year olds Okay, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, it's interview with the vampire, mm-hmm. basically. Yep, yep, you're right. I agree. And then you can see how how out of Anne Rice, mm-hmm. by the early '90s, anytime you saw a vampire, it was actually some form of an Anne Rice vampire. Yeah, it was. I mean, Vampire the Masquerade, all vampire larping, all, it's all Anne yeah. Rice. 
Now, I wonder if Anne Rice was the true progenitor, though, or whether she was inspired by something else. I, I, I'd be curious to know about that. I would, I would say, and this is, again, where um, the, the act of creativity is difficult to pin down, but in the mm. case of Anne Rice, there were little bits and pieces of that kind of vampire before, but she right. was the first one that came up with the idea, as far as I know, that mm. there was some kind of, like, vampire organization or fraternity or they were all part of like the same there was like the guild of vampire kind of they all knew each other they all interacted with each other right yeah hmm that there was a vampire society basically that's her idea yeah. okay that makes and even sense. the the, the quote-unquote urban fantasy th thing kind of comes from that too because that's one of the, the that's the first solidification i can think of of the of mm -hmm. the idea that there are boogly monsters and they have their own society that sort of exists underneath ours. Right. Hmm. Because prior to that, boogly monsters were all one-offs, basically. Yeah. Creatures were all kind of on their own. They were freaks. They were outcast. Whatever. They didn't have a society. Or, or if they did, they were supervillains. That it, it would be like the secret society that's here to take over the world. It, it wasn't that they had their whole like own like lifestyle that existed mm. parallel to our own kind of thing. I think that's not quite true. I mean, think of the Fae, the fairy folk, right. right? They were always supposed to have a life. Uh, they were always supposed to have a society. We, the, oh, what are the Irish ones called? The ones that are basically like, they can be, look like anything pretty oh. much. The Fomori, I think they're okay. called. Well, that's one type of them. Uh, yeah, it was one type of them. Okay, but anyway, but there's yeah, there's and there's the Irish Fae that basically yeah, they're all they're all monsters. It's just and they all have this one giant monster society. Right. There's the idea of the fairy court and everything, which I'm pretty sure is actually an older idea. It's not a new one. Yeah. So we we have had societies of monsters, as you say, or otherworldly creatures living next to ours. That idea is not a new one. I mean, it's always been there. Well, right? it, it is, but like I say, I think the idea that. Um, like the Fae had, they have their own world and it occasionally mm -hmm. touches ours, but it's, it doesn't overlap. It's not like say Hogwarts that's like hidden somewhere in the, like the muggle world and they live amongst the muggles and that, or the, the sexy vampire that like has, has its own like business holdings and that's how it funds its clubbing and, and stuff. It was the idea that it was like a whole other world that occasionally intruded on ours. It didn't exist alongside ours. Ah, uh, okay. That makes sense. Okay. And, um, okay. So I believe you. Okay. <laughs> okay. So probably, so probably Anne Rice then is the actual, is the progenitor of much of what we would call urban fantasy today. Yeah. And I would argue that even she's a strong influence on even Buffy. You could argue that Buffy is just another line of what came out of that. Well, Buff Buffy's the uh, Buffy's the ninja. If okay. you remember, because again, the idea of like the the slayers and the vampires, the vampires were monsters. Same same thing with um, mm -hmm. like the Lost Boys kind of hits on this idea, but again, they're monsters. They're apart from society. And it's like how in in, mm -hmm. in in the eighties the ninja were that the ninja mm -hmm. looked like everybody else, but they were their own like secret world, more like the Fae, and the only thing that could beat a ninja was another ninja and and yeah, you, you went somewhere secret and you okay. learned how to be a ninja and then you came back and at night you ninja other ninjas and, and Buffy kinda Yeah, Buffy kinda draws more from that idea. And that's kinda more Okay. Yeah, and that's more of um, I could see that kind of like a superhero kind of thing because that's part of the idea that mm. that superheroes, they're ordinary people in their their civilian disguise until they have to not be to deal with a super villain. But like the super the super mm. villains never existed, and so, like you never saw Lex Luthor buying eggs. Yeah. That's true. Not, no, well, no, you saw them <laughs> buying eggs, but they were always like weird alien eggs that would hatch and be like like kryptonite yeah, basically, butterflies. Yeah, like the Joker never like runs that. out of toilet paper, you know. It. <laughs> well, and it could be that There's was something we started you. seeing later on, um, the eighties going into the nineties was that idea of of the superhero trying to exist in society, but 
again, that was post Anne Rice and prior to that becoming a superhero or a mm. super villain took you out of society. You were now the Fae. Your your world touched ours, but you lived in a different like in a right. in a whole different universe. Interesting. So you would argue then that Buffy actually comes out of the superhero line, not the urban I would fantasy argue that Buffy vampire comes out line, of the ninja basically. line, which comes out of the superhero line. Hmm. Okay, there we go. Hmm. Okay, so Buffy is a ninja superhero. Got it. Um, and that actually works. I think it works on multiple levels. But I think at a certain point, the Buffy line and the urban yeah, fantasy it's, it's... line crossed over with each other. Oh, no, I was going to say, and... it's like we were saying, everything... Sorry, oh. It's not a line. You don't go from Anne Rice to like Twilight directly. It stuff goes everywhere. Stuff comes back, and and it, it everything's a slightly different mix of the stew. Right. right. Hmm. So reality is a very messy thing. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's let's move on. Then I think we've definitely established <laughs> that reality is messy, just like the show. The show goes all over the place. It's not exactly going in one clear direction. Although probably we'll kind of <laughs> reach an ending at some point, but uh, maybe maybe not. This maybe might not be a three act structure. We'll find out. <laughs> hey, hang in there. We're, not, we're just at the first pinch point, people. Pinch. All right. So. Um, I know one of the things you wanted to discuss, though, which is something that I recently did a blog post about and have been writing about, is the idea that, well, okay, I did a recent blog post, let's talk about that first, where I discussed how there is generally two kinds of stories that I commonly see. Um, one is the hero's journey, and the other is the procedural the Hero's Journey is, of course, what was popularized by George Lucas. If you want right. to know what a Hero's Journey is, it's Star Wars. But that's in its most basic form. But most movies are actually Hero's Journeys of one kind or another. They're a hero who has their life turned upside down and then must deal with the new world, which I mentioned earlier, go through the cycle, eventually find a new direction in their life, uh, set out in that new direction conquer that new direction and be transformed into some new um, mm. person by the end of that story. And so I argued in my uh, blog post that there's another, however, line that you can follow, which is similar and it crosses over with the hero's journey, but which is the procedural where instead of having a story just about a character going through their life and, the character going through an experience of transformation, the procedural is instead about a character following a procedure of some kind mm -hmm. or creating a procedure as the case may be. A good example of a procedural would actually be a standard TV murder mystery show, say CSI, for example, or really any murder mystery pretty much is a procedural, right? They are a character following the police method, whether they're actually a police officer or not, there's going to be a crime, there's going to be an investigation, and everyone who's listening to this probably knows exactly what the steps <laughs> in that investigation are. Why? Because murder mysteries are written exactly the same. They all have the exact same plot structure, but it's a different structure than the one that the hero's journey uses. Okay, so there's that kind of procedure, which I call the standard procedural. However, in my blog post, I pointed out there are actually two other kinds of procedurals. Um, the first kind of procedural that I noted is the creative procedural. A creative procedural is when a character is trying to create something. Now, the key point here is, is that instead of trying to do the hero's journey of personal self-transformation, although that may be going on at the same time, the character is in the act of trying to change themselves in a major, in a more external way, or change the world around them. In fact, in a creative procedure, almost always the world ends up being changed in some way by the character. And there's more outward focused as opposed to inward focus. And creative procedurals are mostly about a character who's slowly navigating um, a system that is not quite set in stone. So there's a lot of flexibility there. It's almost as much an art as it is a science. And to give, just to give you a quick idea, I compare it to a murder mystery or standard procedural is about a character going from point A to point B along like a paved road. They're going between those two points. And they might have a few waypoints they have to meet along the way, like they might stop at the gas station or something mm -hmm. like that, but they're going from A to B. 
with a creative procedural, the character roughly knows the direction they have to go in, and they roughly know some of the paths <laughs> through the forest, so to speak, they have to take. But there are side trails, there are little things, some, you know, a rabbit might pop out, a lion might pop out, stuff could happen on their way. And they're also, key point here, usually trying to build something. Um, usually they're trying to create something. It can be a business. It can be a career. <laughs> it can be um, a cake. It could be almost anything, really. They're just That's why we, I call it a creative procedural. It's about someone trying to create something. And then the third kind of procedural, just to finish out the three, <laughs> um, rule of three here, is that, um, following it back in what Don said earlier, um, is the exploratory procedural, where a character is literally dropped in a new world and has a very rough idea of how to go about things, but is basically making up the procedure as they go along. They're just kind of exploring and creating paths, so to speak. Or as I describe it, they're in the forest with a machete and a compass, and so they're kind of going what they think is the right direction, but they're making a path as they go. I call that an exploratory procedural. And I differentiate that from the hero's journey in one other way, not just because they're creating, but by saying that in a creative procedural or exploratory procedural, What's happening is, is the character is building upon their successes. So the character is faced with a challenge. They try to solve the challenge using whatever skills that they have. They usually fail. They think about it, come up with a new way to solve the challenge, usually by acquiring new skills or resources or something. They overcome that challenge, right. and then they move on to the next challenge. This, this is to differentiate from a hero's journey where the character is just kind of pushing one rock uphill the whole way as opposed to um, dealing with a, as opposed to having a series of successes basically that they're that are all building upon each other where the hero's journey usually is not about building on successes it's often about making the best you can of a bunch of failures at least as I see it anyway see, but I'm still kind of working there, this theory and, out. and this is why I think mentioning all of this is kind of important for for the discussion here. Um, there's three okay. components of a story that I can write the story to highlight. Mm -hmm. And that's the plot, the characters of the setting. Right. And what ends up happening is mm -hmm. the hero's journey, even though it often doesn't do this, is meant to focus on the character. Mm -hmm. That's supposed to be what the story mm -hmm. is ultimately about. The character transforming themselves, going from you know a little or, a little or yeah, to generally, a but it's butterfly. still it's the character. Now, now I'm going to argue yes, that doesn't yeah, always happen, based. but that's mm -hmm. the ideal. Whereas what no. you're discussing with that's the ideal, uh, yes, with the, the different kinds of procedurals, those are stories that are highlighting other mm -hmm. things. So, like um, a standard procedural mm -hmm. is about the plot. That's mm -hmm. the set. Like a murder mystery is about yes, it is. the murder mystery. It's not about detective, you know, bloggins who comes in to solve it, or the vic half the times in in a lot of them, nobody knows really who the victim is until you, yeah, you, you, you see the uh, the research that's done into their background. They're they're a prop more than they are a character. Well, we learn about their story as and their as it pertains to the research, right? Um. And yes, that's very true. When you get to say like the creative or exploratory procedurals, those are stories that actually focus on the setting. Mm -hmm. um, the exploratory one is yes. obvious, but in a creative procedural, what you're actually seeing getting the workout isn't the character so much as the circumstances that they're dealing with. And that's that more defines mm -hmm. the okay. setting than it does the character right. or even what they're doing. Exactly. And that's what I was trying to get at when I said that it's mostly about the mm -hmm. character transforming their world in some way or reshaping their world. Because inevitably in a, in a creative procedural, the main character, even if they're trying to improve themselves, will end up affecting the people right. around them and changing the world around them. They and often become part of a Go new ahead. world. Like... Uh, Sure. Let me. Let, can I just give an example here? Um, my favorite would be something a comic mm -hmm. Don and I both love very much, Bakuman, which is a story about two young artists. Well, one's a writer, one's an, one's a visual artist, who dis, who are in Japan and they decide to become manga artists. They they basically become a writing drawing team to draw comic books in Japan, 
And we watch them go through the life cycle of a manga artist. You know, from young dreamers to uh, getting their first sales to developing new skills and learning the ins and outs of the industry and its good and bad points, etc. And in the process of becoming successful manga artists with a regular mm-hmm. series and everything else, spoilers, um, <laughs> they actually, well, you know what's coming, they actually do somewhat change the lives of some of the people around them. Mm-hmm. And in fact, they even change the industry a little bit. They make the old guard question about what they were doing and whether what they're doing is the right way or not. And they make other artists like strive to become better in some way. Through the act of trying, mm-hmm. they improve the whole system. And this is why Japanese love creative procedurals. In fact, many, many Japanese stories, right. I would argue, are really just creative procedurals. Uh, I, here, I would even argue that um, some com- some of the more famous ones, like, for example, One Piece, mm-hmm. I would argue, is actually a creative procedural. Where what's happening is we've got a character with a set goal, and he's going about that goal, becoming king of the pirates in this case... Maybe, actually, maybe it's exploratory procedural. We could right. actually argue either way, but it's still a procedural, right? Each time he, he goes to a new location, he meets new characters who he has to deal with, and which, are, which is the next step in becoming King of the Pirates. He deals <laughs> with them and then he, successfully, and then he goes on to the next step. And he just keeps, he's slowly working his way literally around the world, dealing with various other pirate mm-hmm. clans and learning new things as he goes. And working towards becoming King of the Pirates, which will happen in another about 10 years, the way the comic and right. show are going, but that's neither here nor there. Um, the key point is, is that he's, and, but in the process, well, he's transforming that, the, the world as well. Is almost more about the world mm-hmm. than it is the character. Like that's, that's what I mean. That um, a lot of Japanese stuff actually mm-hmm. focuses on the setting um, more, more so than yeah. ours in some ways, but that, but that's where the idea too, like we'd said before for a superhero story, they tend to work only as long as mm-hmm. you can keep coming up with neat villains. And that sort of makes them, yep. it kind of balances the gap, but a superhero story is more about the setting than it is necessarily the characters. And that's why. Hmm? Right. Oh, but, uh, sorry to just interrupt for one sec. I know that Yo know, Jack is probably sitting there getting uh-huh. creeped out by all these Japanese references. I'm going to make things really simple for everyone, okay? When I'm talking about a creative procedural, okay. I'm talking about Breaking Bad, okay? Breaking Bad is a creative procedural. It's about a guy who decides he's going to become a drug kingpin, and he and we're watching him go through the steps, okay? So, and and if you want a exploratory procedural, <laughs> go watch The Walking Dead. He, what guy wakes up? Completely new world. Old rules don't work. He has to forge a new path. Exploratory procedural. So if anyone's wondering what the difference between the two is and they want some <laughs> non-icky you know, Japanese references, there you go. Two of the most popular shows, by the way, on the air recently. Well, I was say, Walking I Dead know. is an odd Sorry, example because you're right. And I think that's one of the problems because I know a lot of people kind of like it. And I think that's part of the problem because it's supposed to be about the setting. But it's not. So we get these kind of mm. generic apocalypse survivor characters that aren't the, the, the mm-hmm. every every story is following the same formula. Wander around arguing, find settlement of like people yep. who seem all wonderful and happy, find out they're cannibals, barely escape with your life, wander around arguing. Yep. But I would say the the best and most blatant example of the exploratory one, even though this might make Jack sad. Mm-hmm. Is Pokemon. Yeah, like Ash is a cipher. And we've said that before, how this poor kid is trapped in this perpetual yep. cycle of losing because he can never become the champion because then the story ends. But it's all just about he goes here. Yeah, There's true. these other monsters that he has to like capture and, and, and make fight. And then he goes here and there's more and he goes here and it works a little different. But there's a, and it's the story is about the setting. It's not really about the characters at all. And that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. Um, now the thing I would argue is I think nowadays in some ways, um, what's happened is the hero's journey, which is supposed to focus on the character has kind of shifted so that it's more of the plot. Well, okay. I think we've run into a bit of a problem. Okay. The hero's journey is awesome. Okay. It's awesome for what it is and for movies, but watching, and people right. love to watch a character transform and everything. Okay. 
but it has one rather large flaw. And uh, Dan Harmon, creator of Rick and Morty and Community and that, points this out actually in an article on uh, story structure on, um, oh, what's the name of the site, uh, Channel 101, okay, that he did. Um, he point, I was just reading this the other day, he pointed this out that the problem is, is that characters can only go to like the first two or three steps of the hero's journey mm -hmm. and then they have to stop. Because if they went any right. further, they would begin to transform. But the problem is superhero stories and modern stories and even a lot of the Japanese stuff and that you don't want the character to transform because you're trying to milk as much from this character right. as you possibly can in terms of profits, right? And if the character transformed, they would change. And if they change, they're no longer the character the audience yeah. wants and might, the audience might not come back. So every episode, he uses Friends as the example, mm. um, the TV show Friends, I mean. He, where he says that, yeah, every episode, the characters come right up to the doorstep of change. Like they do something and they, they begin the process of change. They come right up to the doorstep of change and go, wow, change isn't what I want at all. Right. And then they go right back to step two. He uses an eight step story structure. Um, and he basically, yeah, you, when you get to step four, you're like actually starting, <laughs> you're right at the doorstep of change. And he says they, that every episode, that's what they do. They're trapped in this perpetual cycle of going steps two, three, and four, bang, two, three, and yeah. four, bang. Cause that's what the episode is. Because if they ever go any farther, they'd actually change. And I would argue yeah. that's what superhero comics do as well. And that's what many stories do. They keep the character in a perpetual state of almost verging on change but not quite because again if they did the story which is meant to be a See, perpetual story would I fall think, apart um, the hero's journey idea post lucas making it a thing mm. um it, it's got that problem that mm. it sort of shifted over the years to be more of a plot thing exactly because of that because it assumes mm. that the journey comes to an end and if I got to keep cranking out right. episode after episode of, of my, my sitcom, we can never do that. Because as soon as we do that, like you say, things have changed. People might not be, like, they mm -hmm. won't be happy with that change. Right. Um, actually, I can't believe it. I just thought of the most obvious exploratory procedure of them all. And I can't believe I didn't see it when I was writing Star Trek. Star Trek is inherently... Ex well, okay, I guess it depends on which one we're talking about. But it's a exploratory procedural. You're, it's about more about the setting and whatever they encounter. The characters never change. They're trapped in this perpetual state as they keep encountering things. Although, uh, so go, <laughs> it's... Okay, sorry, I have to think about this for a minute. But, uh, right. well, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. I'll have to think about that. No, it's okay, because... Um, but, sorry, I interrupted. Because that's okay, a good example. This part out. And... You 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 think I'm right that it the the that it is a exploratory procedural where the character because the one problem with this idea is the characters in Star Trek aren't really they're exploring so I guess they're gaining knowledge yeah but they're but not that's, really building anything the, the, that's but where I guess, I'd say like the creative mm -hmm. and exploratory tend to be similar they're the same thing except exploratory is the character is moving outward to find the novelty whereas creative they're moving inward mm -hmm. to find the novelty. Oh, that's interesting. Differential. Okay, I'll think about it. And then yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I can Trek, see that. The original Trek, anyway, is kind one. of a good example because it's, it's one of those weird hybrid things where, and this is, again, I'm going to mm -hmm. come back to my idea that you should never take a formula at face value. You shouldn't get wrapped around the axle about what exactly something is. Um, because it's definitely right. like, say, a exploratory procedural but they made the point, and mm -hmm. this is where I think um, a lot of uh, the, the formulas don't quite, well, I won't say don't work, but don't make me happy. They made the point of putting a little more mm. uh, like attention to the characters than you normally would. And because of that, mm -hmm. you could do stories that happen because of this character specifically. Right. Like, okay, and um, okay, you, uh, could you some give of an the example? blatant examples would be there's more than a few episodes where you run into like one of Kirk's old girlfriends, 
and she has some kind of murderous like right. revenge plot against him. And and that's exactly it. Like it's Kirk. You you couldn't do that with Spock, even though they kind of try in the new movies. I see your mm. point. Well, they're very character specific. Okay, I see your point. Mm. They're character specific stories. But I also see your point where they're fall but the story structure yeah. is still the standard procedural. It really is. It's an exploratory procedural, but it's a standard procedural where they're faced with a problem and they try different mm-hmm. ways to solve it and they eventually solve it. And it's ultimately still about the it is... setting more than is the characters. Yeah, the and si- I think what was clever setting, about I that say. and why I say it's sort of a hybrid is the moral mm-hmm. of the story always in the original anyway was always what carried the day was humanity. Mm-hmm. Like it, it was compassion. Mm-hmm. It was um, like, say forgiveness, wisdom, patience. There's even an episode where comedy beats the alien. And to do mm-hmm. that, you have to kind of concentrate more on the characters because you need those traits to be appropriate to the character. And that's why like, Star Trek right. looks like your old-fashioned, two-fisted, pulp-era, Buck Rogers kind of story. Because it's got all the trappings. Mm-hmm. But you'd never see one of those, those like, old-school space opera heroes um, winning because of compassion. Because mm-hmm. they were all... Right, that's true. Because that wasn't the... That wasn't the... Virtue or or it would time. be, that but all those characters valued. are written to be the square-jawed, two-fisted, scientifically brilliant action-adventurer guy. And because of that, they never set things mm. up that would make that seem appropriate. And that was where, like I say, Trek was interesting mm-hmm. because they set up characters that to have them have like emotional reactions seemed appropriate to them. Because they put that idea in your head before the story. Right. And then that... Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that goes with... Um, that makes sense. A lot of, say, like, genre heroes. They're not designed mm-hmm. for that full range. They're part of... They're part of the, the genre formula. They're part of the plot in a lot of times. They're organic components of the plot. In a way. and And they're not designed... As a person, so there's a lot of stuff you can't really expect them mm-hmm. to do, right? Because they're very limited. They're they're cre- they're creatures that exist to yeah. do that one particular role, unless and they don't somehow have a lot of you flexibility. work it in. And that, yeah, well, yes, and it can be done. It, it definitely can be done. I definitely see your point on that. And I would say, if anything, I would say modern television. We we had a weird thing going on where. Modern television has, at least it seems, somewhat right. outgrown procedurals. Okay, or is at least trying right. to outgrow procedurals, I should say. So back in the day, we got the you know, problem of the episode stories. Now we've got two kinds of stories. Now we've still got procedurals, <laughs> but they come in different flavors. So we've got stories that are maybe heroes' journeys, but right. are broken down kind of like procedurals. Um, and we've got, we've got classic procedurals. I mean, CSI is still on the air, right? We've uh-huh. still got those stories kicking around because people love them. There's always those stories, but now we've got the, the HBO Netflix model and everything where right. it's season long story arcs and everything is broken. Everything ultimately is a hero's journey because people want that hero's journey. But what they've done is they've kind of elongated it. So you're getting like a piece of the hero's journey and say overall there's a hero's journey going on, but it's going to be spread out over like four seasons. And so, and so what they're doing is they're giving you really, really tiny pieces of the hero's journey, which are not really that different from a procedural, but they're doing it in such a way that there, you can see where there is a hero's journey story going on in the background. It does. They're doing something. Does that make any sense? And I, and I got, I got like a couple, so many good Mm -hmm. examples of this. Uh, What they're doing is. Okay. They're focusing on character. So they're. Well, and Mm -hmm. no, that, but this is weird. Because we haven't really done that for a long Mm -hmm. time. And they're starting to integrate Mm -hmm. the character and the plot 
more than because all of the formulas you mentioned mm-hmm. on your website most of them are their plot they're just plot here's how to put together the plot for your story when you get to the uh, Michael Moorcock one, he's basically, so. yeah, and whatever character, just do do something. Have, check your random list, roll a d20, however you want to do it. Whereas, say, well, because <laughs> okay, there's, we'll um, okay, so when you get to, like, say the HBO ones or, like, the Showtime, or, like, you mentioned Breaking Bad. Mm-hmm. The emphasis in that story is on Walter yep. White. Even though it's yes. a, a standard procedural they took the time to add a little bit more to the character. Mm-hmm. And we've had attempts to do mm-hmm. this that have met with limited success even prior. And, and this is where I'd talk about, um, uh, law and order. I enjoyed mm-hmm. the original. Mm-hmm. The original was always about the, the crime. Like it, it was plot, but they had, right. The characters were familiar and like like everybody loved Lenny. Well, he's mm-hmm. the ex alcoholic, third generation Irish New York cop. Well, we know that guy. They'd give you just yeah. enough to to realize, yeah. oh, he's this guy. Just enough of a twist so he stood out as that guy, and they were off and running. Mm-hmm. When you get to like yeah. the 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 one that like yeah. runs now, um, special victims CSI does the same kind of thing. They're trying mm-hmm. to make the characters characters mm-hmm. while still doing a standard procedural. So you get all these weird things yes. where all of a sudden character A in this one episode, something happens that triggers them and now they're just really angry for that episode. And you're like, why is that guy angry? That doesn't, or all of a sudden somebody will have like a, like they did one with a gambling addiction that kind of just comes out of nowhere and it ties into the plot more than mm-hmm. the character because this is a character that we've never seen them show any traits of an addictive personality. Um, we've never seen any of the symptoms of trying to hide something. Mm-hmm. It just literally comes out of nowhere because they said, well, let's spice it up. Let's make it more relatable. Um, gambling problem. Mm-hmm. Eeny, meeny, miny. Okay, you. You're the one that has it. And and that's like, say, the flip side of, mm-hmm. of something like your, your Breaking Bad or even like your, your Dexter where they plan that ahead of time right? and they work it in. Um, another good example mm-hmm. are superheroes that DC heroes, their archetypes mm-hmm. like Batman is like dark. Superman is the right, gooder yeah. than good guy. When Marvel came about, they focused mm-hmm. a little more on character. And that was characters with problems, make them more relatable. We saw a little bit of them trying to fit yep. into the, the normal world. Whereas for decades, nobody thought, you know, Clark Kent is the world's biggest nerd. And then he takes off his specs and nobody recognized because mm-hmm. it was all about the plot. The Marvel guys added a little more. They wanted a little more character. Right. And I think getting back to the conversation we had with Doak, that's one of the problems we have now that mm-hmm. Marvel movies are entertaining because the characters are more like people. Whereas if you want to do that with the DC characters, because they're closer to archetypes, you've got to find some way to put a couple of extra steps in to make them a character mm-hmm. rather than an archetype. And it doesn't usually work because they do it wrong. Um, like the, the, the Superman movie where he's like angry and brooding and wandering from aimless job to job. That's mm-hmm. valid, but that's not Superman because Superman has always been, he's cheerful, he's hopeful, he never gives up. You went totally against all of that, never gave us the shift over to what we already knew. You made a movie about a generic superhero. Mm. Well, this is where superheroes still have a extra problem, right? I think we talked about this, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure we talked about this in a previous show, where superheroes are characters yeah. that, as we've said, are designed for procedurals. They're designed for procedural stories, but they're yeah. trying to put them into the hero's journey. And so they don't quite work. It doesn't quite fit when you jam a superhero into a, into a hero's journey, as strange as that might sound. Because superheroes aren't meant to actually change. They're meant to, as we said earlier, walk up to the door of change and say, "Uh, uh-uh, no thanks, none of that changed for me, and go right back again. Because if they changed, they'd stop being the hero that everyone wants to see for the next movie. 
So you get like uh, lots of fake and pseudo change where they'll, <laughs> you know, they'll change the deck chairs. Like they might have a new costume or they might actually you know, have a beard now or they might actually like change a little bit, sort of, kind of, almost, but not really. Um, you know, their environment might change, but the hero will never change. Not a superhero because they can't. Um, the only time a superhero can actually change is maybe when they're having their origin story. Which is, of course, why most yeah. superhero movies are origin stories. At least the first one is anyway. Because that's the one time they actually can do a hero's journey. You're watching a hero go through a hero's journey. And they become that hero. Problem is, as soon as movie number two comes yeah. around, the writers are stuck. Because they can't change the character again. He is who he is. Superman. He is Batman. He is Iron Man now. What do you do with him? See, and that's Because and that's you right. can't change him anymore. Um, the comics used to have a catch where they could, but you could only do it every like five years. And it was because like right. a, a superhero comic doesn't end, but back in the day, prior to the eighties, the typical mm. fan only read them for like three or five years. And you'd see that three to five. Yeah. Yeah. So every five years you could just do yeah, a reset. Yeah, or you'd totally it was change it anyway. for some reason nobody would like ask questions. And you can see that going back to some of the earliest ones like, um, say, Dick Tracy. When Dick Tracy started, it was a mm -hmm. pretty realistic, grounded, straight up, like, detective story. And then they added, like, around <laughs> the World War II era, you started, they added the weird villains. Um, In the 60s, mm -hmm. they added, like, the super tech and there was the colony on the moon with the moon people and stuff. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Yep. I can give a better, more ah. modern example. Dr. Who. Every time Dr. Who has a new showrunner, it basically See, becomes an entirely that. different series. Well, they didn't plan it originally. Well, yeah, sort of. No, they didn't plan that. Even the current one doesn't exactly plan it. I mean, whoever, whatever new showrunner comes in, they just basically say, yep, this is how we're going to go tone-wise. This is going to be the style of the show yeah, now. Yeah, well, they, they have and the they idea go for Generation that. too. that it gives them a story-based idea, like a story-based uh, grounding for doing that reset. Yep, exactly. When the new Doctor comes in mm -hmm. or the new showrunner, bang, everything changes. And it, usually even if it's the same showrunner, when a new Doctor comes in, they try to change yeah. it up a bit just to make it different. And try different things. True. Sometimes better, <laughs> sometimes worse. Depends. <laughs> There's no way to, but anyway, but there's that idea again of, well, most fans are probably going to watch this for a few years, so we'll, and if, and, but that's what, what they say about Doctor Who, right? If you don't yep. like the current Doctor Who, <laughs> wait three years. Speaking of which, Capaldi has just officially oh, announced wow. that he's out. Next season is his last one, and Moffat's leaving too, so the new Doctor, Capaldi will apparently have one more season, and then when he's done, there's going to mm -hmm. be a total reset, surprise, new showrunner, new Doctor, yeah. new companions, new style, everything is going to reset after next season. And that's fine, yeah. that's perfectly okay, it's still be Doctor Who, because that's the way it's set up. But as you said, superhero comics used to do that quite on the QT. Yeah. They used to quietly do that anyway. Especially if there was a major writer-artist team or something like that. Usually that writer-artist team would have their arc that they'd write for maybe a couple years and then they'll leave and a new writer-artist yeah. team will come in who will completely shake things up and try different things with the character. Usually after resetting them or back to zero some, or whatever version that they A lot of times too they they'd liked. throw in trends. Like that's why if you look at the right. yeah, superhero comics... In the 80s and early 90s, everybody was a ninja. He's Wolverine, the Canadian yep, ninja. Okay, well, sure, if we're going that route. Yep. You know, they did that, yep. the Batman ninja animated awesome. series, where you find out, like, Batman was a samurai who, you know, because of his, his training. There's that episode where his old sensei tells him that, you know, that he embodies the true nature of the samurai, wearing a mask, mm. skulking around at night, using gadgets, just like all samurai. He's a fucking just like all sarah that's what i was thinking it's like uh no i mean he mm. you he, come on he's a ninja just deal with it come and on they, accept it guys batman is a ninja he's a ninja yeah, by the late 80s the he's, he's always been and that was because ninjas were cool so they just jammed him in wherever they could mm -hmm. yep <laughs> and he's been a ninja well, no, ever he... since so going back to where we were um because that's the way formulas work and that's the mm -hmm. way show uh, that's the way writing formulas work so we've got a set of writing formulas that are plug and play 
and we use them for a long time and we right. still we're still using them in various forms but things have kind of evolved and so now we're the audience is expecting yeah. more character based stuff and they're expecting character based stuff that is um that has real development like they want to see change actually happening because you know change means things different it means things are different interesting it's like right. you're want you want to see where this goes now you want to see does Walter White really become a major drug kingpin, and once he does, what does you know? How does he deal with this, and where does he go with all this? Or you know, where does Rick lead his crew of the Walking of mm-hmm. Walking Dead survivors, and um, you know, what <laughs> right. group of cannibals does he lead them to this week, uh, or sorry, this yeah. season? Because that's the thing, right? It's all season now. Because everything has a season long arc, which is usually I've noticed a hero's journey arc. Um, I've noticed that if I look at my Save the Cat formula that we mentioned earlier, if I look at it and I map it out on your average Netflix or whatever season, I've noticed yeah. they all match up exactly. The the whole the season, if taken as one say thirteen hour long movie, if I map the hero's journey plot onto it or the standard Hollywood movie plot basically onto it, it'll yeah. hit all those points, and it really will. You can actually, and you can see them all happening. There's a the main character is usually going on that quasi hero's right. journey that Hollywood stories all use now, no matter what genre they are. Except, of course, for mysteries, which still generally follow the procedure, yeah, but that's not the same always. Thing, like I was saying, when you look at your CSIs and your Law and Orders and that, that are supposed to be straight up procedures. A lot of them mm. are trying to work those character bits in. Yeah, that's true. They're, well, they're trying, but the thing is they're kind of jamming yeah. them in as opposed to doing them naturally. And also I've noticed, because my wife watches a <laughs> lot of those, hi dear, um, that they tend to follow an interesting pattern, which is they're doing the same thing, where there will be some character bits, and but they will be occurring over the course of the whole season, and they will inevitably lead up to some big character-driven climactic moment that will happen mm-hmm. usually at mid-season, because that's right. when the show goes on a break for a month or two, on uh, American TV anyway. And then there will always, always be some huge major character shake-up event yeah. that will happen at the end of the season to cap it off. And that's where the character has to come face to face with their like greatest fears or whatever. They get buried alive or they get stuck, mm-hmm. you know, they get hunted by a serial killer. And usually with most of them, there's a big cliffhanger where you know, like character X is dead or character Y is dead or maybe one of them's dead, but we don't know which one. And like character Z is going off to like join the join the uh, FBI academy now. They're leaving the police force right. and everyone's going in different directions. Okay? Then the new season will start, and the first episode will basically spend the whole time wrapping all those plot lines up in such a way that everything is exactly back to where it was at the exact pre- beginning of the previous season. It will undo everything that that, that, that stuff did, unless one of the characters, decide, <laughs> one of the actors, decide to ask for more money. In which case, they really are written out of the show, and they will re- be replaced true. by you know, someone I else. A lot of them do. Is. When you get that wrap-up right. that resolves all the plots, they're not showing it. You're just seeing, like, everybody mm-hmm. sitting down. How would you escape from, like, the, the thousand ancient Mongol warriors that were summoned up? Oh, I gave him a Twinkie and he died of food poisoning. Ah, Like, they're, they're literally just tying eight, nine things up in the one episode in the quickest way possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because they're trying desperately to get on with the, a standard story episode, basically, you know, the mm-hmm. standard procedural plot story of the episode, and they, but they have to shoehorn in solving like you know <laughs> all that huge cliffhanger events and everything like that. So they, so that becomes the character element, you know, the five to ten minutes of character element that are allowed per episode, and then, but there's also a mystery mm-hmm. going on at the same time or whatever, you know, that they still they still have to solve because <laughs> right. they're still CSIs. Damn it. Yeah, and so on we go from there. So yeah, the procedural, the procedural, which is the most native, I would say, form of uh, television or yeah. storytelling there is. Really, I mean, because you can't heroes' journeys. The problem is, is ultimately they're a journey of transformation, change, and as we've said in proper television, 
if you want a long story, you can't have the character change, not quickly anyway. They yeah. have to do it very, very slowly. So how do you fill in that yeah. time? You go back to the procedural formula. Or you really, <laughs> really stretch it out. Um, there's a couple of different tricks you can use. Um, mm. Game of Thrones is a good example of this. Where Game of Thrones, I would argue, is a creative procedural. A kingdom has fallen apart and now a whole bunch of people right. are trying to become the new king. They're all going about it in different ways, but there's still send generally a general pattern that you follow when you're trying to become the new king, right? And so what they do is they have a whole bunch of different people who are trying different approaches at the same time. Well, that fills up an incredible amount of um, <laughs> airtime really, really fast. Just as George R. R. Martin's books it are, are thick doorstoppers for that exact same reason. He's got a whole bunch of different viewpoint characters all trying to do similar things but slightly different ways and slightly different twists on it. And so end result is you end up with this massive story that even he's <laughs> let get out of control and doesn't know how to end anymore, I don't think. Um, but that's one way to do it. I mean, if you want to write a massive procedural, that's you, know, you have a whole bunch of characters doing right. similar stuff and it fills up airtime super quick. Um, where's <laughs> I going with this? I don't remember. Anyway, um, so... And so that's one way to attach or that's one way to do the procedural thing and kind of still also kind of be doing the hero's journey thing at mm -hmm. the same time, which they kind of do. I mean, people want hero's journeys, but Hollywood doesn't want to yeah. give it to you because they're not profitable is what it really comes down to. Not a true hero's well, they, they journey. They can not be, really. but it's, it's, it's that idea if it takes off and you want to make more. It, my, my favorite example of uh -huh. that would be Rocky. First one was was yeah. fantastic. Had like a surprise twist ending. Um, so then what they ended up doing? They made mm -hmm. the second one, which is basically what the first one would have been mm -hmm. if it had the standard ending. And then they do like yep three, and then eventually he like establishes world peace because he like punches out like a Soviet android, and then the 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 rumor is that Predator was actually supposed to be, like, a Rocky film. Yeah, it was kind of a half joke that somebody said, well, he established world peace, what do we do now? Well, he fights aliens! And then they kind of hummed and hawed about that, and that idea is what became Predator. Okay, well, so in a very, very loose sense, it, it helped to inspire Predator. But yeah, you could see that. I mean, let's face it, Predator ultimately yep. comes down to a fist fight with an alien. Yep. <laughs> hmm... So when you when you think of it that way, it's like yeah, the, you could just fill in Stallone instead of um, yeah. Schwarzenegger. There, same movie doesn't really change at all. I mean, the main <laughs> character is just about as intelligible. Yo, <laughs> oh, get to the chopper! But except for that, <laughs> instead of get to the chopper, other than that, it's about the same thing, right? It, it's quasi Italian <laughs> accent instead of a you know Eastern European one. That was always my, my, except my for that, fear we're good. When, when they teamed up for films, was is this going to be subtitled? Oh my god, what the hell? Anyway. Um, actually, they did. There was a movie called, was it Lock Up or something? Where they, actually oh, they teamed up now. just like a year ago. Yeah, they've so done back. a few because no everybody one liked the, uh, the Expendables. Oh, the Expendables, yeah. That's true. Not, they weren't. I don't think he fully teamed up in the Expendables movie, but I only got through the first okay. two, and then I kind of lost interest. So I don't know. Maybe he did. I thought he was just appearing as kind of like a walk-on yeah, part in the Expendables movies. He's like the yeah, guy who sends there, them on their so missions or it something. Technically counts. <laughs> he was there. Yeah, he does interact with Stallone. He does interact. He does interact with Stallone, kind of, sort of. But there's an actual film where the two yeah, of them like are actually the like trying to escape the a prison together. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so um did we want to actually look at any specific like story, you know, how to put together story formulas or do we just want to go in some other direction at this point? I'm not sure <laughs> where we're going to go with this there's point. There's actually a couple of the formulas that I think are um, pertinent. Okay. Okay, so okay. why don't we talk about some of the specific formulas then, Don? Which ones do you think are especially um, noteworthy or interesting <laughs> from the ones I've collected on my site? I mean, there's 
I think about 20 of them at this point. So which ones do you think are the most effective or interesting or at least apply most to what we're talking about? Well, you're a big uh, fan of the Lester Dent one. Yes, I am. I'm a big fan of the Lester Dent one, especially for short stories. I mean, he breaks it down into a very, very mm. simple four-act structure that follows right. the four-act structure perfectly. Um, I can even quickly read it if you want. I can actually let, let the audience hear something of this. Um, okay, so for he breaks it down into 1,500-word chunks. Okay, so here's an idea. Just so I'll read you the first one, okay? Um, first 1,500 words. First line, or as here to, or as near here to as possible, introduce the hero and swat him with a fistful of trouble. Hint at a mystery, a menace, or a problem to be solved, something the hero has to cope with. The hero pitches in to cope with this fistful of trouble. He tries to fathom the mystery, defeat the menace, solve the problem. Introduce all the other characters as soon as possible. Bring them in on action. Bring them on in action. Next part. His hero's endeavors land him in an actual physical conflict near the end of the first 1500 words. Near the end of the first 1500 words, there is a complete surprise twist in the plot development. And then there's a, some notes about, um, uh, does it have suspense? Is there a menace to the hero? Does everything happen logically? And he talks a little now, bit about what you know, thing in there, is going to happen. That people don't necessarily, because he oh, mentions okay, what? introduce all the other characters as soon as possible. What you're actually doing yes, there yes, he does. is you're putting ideas in the audience's mm -hmm. head. Because you're, you're showing them yes. who all is involved. You're giving them... And that, that's a, that's kind of a concept yep. that, um, I think a lot of people who write, especially genre stories don't quite get is the in, you have to give the audience some way to, to, to get into the circumstance to understand what's going on. Oh, I see it as something a tiny bit different. I mean, from when I read that, I see that as an example mm -hmm. of uh Chekhov's gun. <laughs> and no, I don't mean Phaser, I mean Gunn. We're talking about Anton Chekhov, the mm -hmm. Russian playwright. At least I think his name was Anton. Um, the Chekhov, the Russian playwright, not Chekhov, the Star Trek character for whom was named for the playwright. Chekhov is famous for saying that if you put a gun on the mantelpiece in the first act, mm -hmm. it has to be used before the last act. So that everything has to be set up is basically what he's talking about. If anything that appears in the story, especially is important to the story, has to be there right near the beginning so that the audience is aware of it. It's an element mm -hmm. that's in the, in the uh, audience's minds. And that's what I see that all the other characters yep, being I introduced agree, as soon as possible. Yeah, and that meaning. sets everything up so you don't get that, who the hell is that kind of thing? Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's go to the <laughs> next set. Second 1500 words. Part 1. Shovel more grief onto the hero. Part 2. Hero, being heroic, struggles and his struggles lead up to another physical conflict. Or a surprising plot twist to end the 1500 words. And this, of course, and he says, Now, does the second part have suspense? Does the menace grow like a black cloud? Is the hero ganging in the neck? Is the second part logical? Don't tell about it. Show how the thing looked. This is one of the secrets of writing. Never tell the reader. Show him. He trembles, roving eyes, slackened jaw and such. Mm -hmm. Make the reader see him. Okay? And so characterize the story actor. Give him tags. Make him do things that stick out in the reader's mind or give him tags that make him stick out in the reader's mind. Okay? Build your plot so the action can be continuous. I'm editing a few things right. out here, just skipping through just for brevity here. Um, third 1500 words. Shovel the grief onto the hero. The hero makes some headway and corners the villain or somebody <laughs> in a physical conflict. Surprise. It, and finally, a surprising plot twist in which the hero preferably gets in the neck bad to end the 1500 words. And again, he says, does it still have suspense? The menace getting blacker? The hero finds himself in a hell of a fix? Does it all happen logically? That's the way to go. And he makes notes here about the, each physical conflict could end different. It could be a fist fight, a poison gas people yelling mm -hmm. at each other, whatever. There are different ways to do it. Try to avoid monotony and keep it original. Keep the a action swift. Keep the atmosphere alive with lots of detail. Add lots of s scenery, description. Keep it all going. The secret to all writing is to make every word count, as he says here. And finally, we have the fourth 1500 words. In other words, Act 4. Shovel the difficulties more thickly on the hero. Get the hero almost buried in his troubles. 
the hero extricates himself using his own skill training or brawn. And I think that's the important one. He gets himself out using his own skill. Four, step four of fourth part. uh, The mystery is remaining. One big one, one big one held over his head to grip the reader's interest, which will be cleared up in the final conflict as the hero takes the situation in hand. Finish with a final twist, a big surprise, and a snapper, a punchline to end it all. Has the suspense held out to the last line? The menace held out to the last line? Everything been explained? It all happened logically? Is the punchline enough to leave the reader with that warm feeling? Did God kill the villain or the hero? This is how it should end. All right, and there's roughly a slightly trimmed down version of Lester Dent's four act how to write a story in 6,000 words formula. Um... I think that right there kind of defines the core of the pulps. And that's the formula that's Mm. carried over for a lot of our, like, action stories, horror stories, suspense stories. Like, they're still Mm -hmm. following that almost exactly. Yep. Oh, yeah. When I watch, say, uh, you know, a modern show like, say, Arrow or The Flash or something, one of those, like, CW superhero shows, when I look at them, I can see all of this still happening in those shows. Like each episode is usually usually mm-hmm. following a lot of these key points. Like they're they're there somewhere. They try to layer a little more character on it. It's kind of like icing on a cake to make it look nice and everything. But underneath yeah. well, the structure his, is still his there. His formula's not too bad because again, it's it's really specific as to the uh timing of the events, but not the events themselves. Mm-hmm. Yep, I agree. And it's actually quite nice in a lot of ways. I mean I've heard of writers who have used this formula for comedy, for romance, even for erotica. They've used it for all kinds of different stories because it's ultimately a fairly simple four-act structure that just says, yep. keep things building yep. up until you reach a climax. And uh, he's got a lot of good points about, yep, make it really interesting right. for the reader, and the reader will just keep reading it. And I've written a couple stories using this formula just for practice and for fun, and it works pretty well. It really does. I mean, once you get the hang of it, it's actually you. It's actually a formula you can right. use to just kind of just crank them out if you want to. You just have to insert your hero, insert your other characters, and you're off and running, basically. The only problem that I find is, at least in my own takes on this story, where I've been using it for short stories, they yeah. tend to be very plot-driven. Because you've all got this plot, though it's fairly simple, is still yeah. running very strongly in the background. Like the character is not really doing things exactly. Like if you're doing it right, the character, it comes across as though the character is actually pushing the story forward. But in reality, they're being pulled along by the plot as much as they are um, running the story themselves. Actually, yeah. really, they are being pushed along by the plot. The events generally are and driving them in the, one particular direction. And that's the right? problem with a lot of the formulas. Or another. Um, any of them. Is they they really... Because mm. if you have a unique character, that leads to a unique story. If you're going to start from the character. Um, if you look at his formula, he says, the mm. hero, the hero. The, this happens to the hero. This, there, There's absolutely... That hero could be anybody because it really kind of doesn't matter. <laughs> Well, actually, that's an interesting point. You bring that up, which is that he's constantly referring to the hero, and it's constantly about how the world is acting on the hero. The hero is passive in this story. The hero is something that the world is pushing in a direction, carrying along as though it's a wind or a river, as opposed to the hero actually doing things himself. I mean, it does finish with the hero extricating himself using their own skill, but at the same time, they got into this situation because the, See, the story pushed them into the it. The hero saves himself kind of thing is important because that mm. ends up validating why the hero is the hero. On a subliminal level, right. if it's just like, yeah, like an act of God that saves the day, then that schmo could have been anybody. Why are we bothered with this guy's story? Right. But that moment where he justifies himself by using his unique abilities to save the day shows that he is the hero and why he's it's one of them fine yeah that makes sense that i think it's an easy step to over like like to 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 miss but if you're going to use that formula that's kind of Mm. important because 
if if it, it's like the Batman stories where Batman thinks his way out in the end and catches the villain, mm-hmm. it's more satisfying than when he just pulls out the bat shark repellent and beats the bad guy and like it doesn't feel as arbitrary. Right. And remember, as we've just said earlier, the wonderful thing about this formula is the yep. character is the same character at the beginning and the end. The character has gone through a whole adventure. But in the end, they haven't actually changed, so they're the exact same character for the next story. Or you right. could even read the stories in whatever order you want. And that's a good thing, I suppose, in some ways. But it also can make them a little dull if you get too many of them. But I think that's why most pulp characters, you know, they have a maybe at most a couple dozen stories about them. And then they usually peter out eventually. Yeah, and it's the superhero and sometimes thing. Not if even you that come long. up with like a, a more inventive villain or a more inventive like scheme... That carries the story. Well, here, uh, Dent says that in his formula, actually, early on. Part I skipped this part where he says, um, here's how it starts. A different murder method for the villain to use. Two, a different thing for the villain to be seeking. Three, a different locale. Four, mm-hmm. a menace which is to hang like a cloud over the hero. One of these different things would be nice. <laughs> Two is better. Three, swell. It may help if they are fully in mind before tackling the rest. In other words... He basically just says, if you have at least two or three of these elements, which are unique and make the story yeah, I, a little bit different, you're good to go. That he realizes that formula is formula, whereas mm-hmm. years later, people who follow that might not necessarily realize it. And that's how you get like bland, generic stuff. Well, he, he tells you in the formula that this is a formula. He says, the business of building stories seems not much different mm-hmm. from the business of building anything else. Yeah. He sees himself as a workman and as someone who is just mm-hmm. like he's laying bricks or something like that. He literally thinks that this is the uh, formula for building right. a house, very much a procedural. And that's fine. Actually, he says that the majority of pulps are formula. <laughs> Most editors who say they don't want formula don't know what they're talking about. Some editors right. won't buy anything but formula. And by the way, he got <laughs> super rich writing this formula and... Um, yeah. Yeah, did very well for himself. Um, he literally was a he was an incredible guy. He basically used this formula to write tons and tons of stories, uh, mostly about Doc Savage, who we've mentioned before in our pulp episode. And as an end result, he literally would just whip these books off one or one a week or so, and then spend the rest of his time adventuring, sailing, and doing all the things <laughs> that adventuring characters actually do. That's that's the funny part. He actually lived the lifestyle of an adventurer. <laughs> and if I remember right, died the lifestyle of an adventure. I think he That's fell so off weird. a horse, if I remember right. Um, mm. He fell off a horse and broke his neck or something. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. The thing is, is that, yeah, he viewed this as a formula for, for being a workman. And I think if someone who's listening to this is a beginning writer and they want to try writing a story and they want a structure that will absolutely work, yeah. with just a little bit of effort, this is it. I mean, find the Lester Dent Master Formula, it's called. Um, it's up on my website, and there'll be a link to it in the show notes. Read it, follow it, go to it. It takes a little bit of practice, but with a tiny bit of practice, you two can be <laughs> pumping out formula yeah, stories. And the thing is, as I mentioned earlier, they can be like training wheels. I mean, you might say, well, I don't want to write formula stories, but write a few of them, and you can get the hang of writing and some of the other craft elements to it, and then you can let go of the formula and go to other things if you want, and write a proper hero's journey, and write... Yeah. Write another formula instead. Have fun. Um, I saw someone not too long ago in a comment, but a discussion about the hero's journey. Someone was complaining about, um, you know, orig- you know that they, why is Hollywood so unoriginal? You know, why is it always this hero's journey stuff? And someone else said something to the effect of, well, you can go off and write your original story, but probably when you are finished it and go back and look at it, you'll realize you've probably written a hero's journey mm-hmm. anyway. Right. Sad, but probably true. Um, for most people, I mean, occasionally people do write original stuff, but that's called literary <laughs> fiction and it doesn't sell. Unless well, of course, true. Oprah yeah. decides it's awesome. Then it will sell. <laughs> um, but that's the only reason people buy those books. And I, you yeah. have to wonder how many people actually read them. But then again, I don't know. I shouldn't hark on literary fiction. Right. I mean, literary fiction has its place and it can be 
very stimulating. I mean, the whole point of literary fiction is it's supposed to be something that you have to work your way through, mm. like complex ideas and stuff. And if you want a mental workout and you want to explore the craft of writing and some of the directions right. it can go, literary fiction is awesome for that. <laughs> However, if you want to make money, at you don't not, want to go with literary fiction. At least not full not blown. It's another one friend. of them things that even if you're writing the most like generic pop culture stuff, you can borrow some of those techniques and mm -hmm. sneak them in. Yep, that's true. And actually, here's one thing. I mean, if you want to write literary fiction, you can do that as well as writing your pulp stuff. You can write your formula romances. They pay the bills. And then in between, you write your literary fiction, which you also publish right. to, you know, mass acclaim that's okay well there are actually lots of writers that do that a lot of literary writers the reason they only put out one or two literary books every couple of years is they're busy chunking out romance novels in between yeah <laughs> um or other things that's especially common these days with the self-publishers yeah. and the independent publishers so oh, was there any other formulas that i had up on the site that caught your eye that you want to discuss the other one that kind of builds on that was the uh, how to write a book in three days Ah, yes, Michael Moorcock's formula. Yeah. Um, for those who don't know, Michael Moorcock was famous for his Elric series, which mm -hmm. is mostly about a moody elven prince with a blood-drinking sword who goes around um, killing people, if I remember right. I've never read any of them. I just vaguely oh, yeah. know of That's, them. Have, uh, have you ever read any Elric it, stories? It, it's a really kind of shorthand, but not unfair assertion of them. That's that's kind of what I picked up over the years because I you know I've been exposed to Elric indirectly because of course back in the seventies and eighties when we grew yeah. up Elric was super popular. There's actually for a, while a Blues there. Cult song about him, and as I recall, it was actually written by Michael Moorcock. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, that's even better. Michael Moorcock actually wrote the song. That's pretty good, in fact. Hmm. Actually, you know, I can, given the feel, especially of 70s, 80s, <laughs> Blue Oyster Cult, yep. Elric fits right in. <laughs> All right, so let's go through some of the elements. Now, this is a little less, it's a formula, but okay, I should explain this to the reader. The Michael Moorcock formula is called How to Write a Book in Three Days. At its core, basically what you're doing is you're basically preparing a whole ton of notes and getting a whole pile of stuff ready that you can use, working out a rough plot line, and then you just kind of go. You basically just start writing and don't stop, and the idea is everything's already there when you need it. If you need a scene, you just grab it from your list. If you need a uh, piece of equipment you, or character, you just grab them from your list. A name, you grab them from your list. It's basically you get all the ingredients ready, kind of like a, making a Chinese meal. You get all the ingredients ready, and you just start to tossing them in the wok. That's why I call, call it writing Chinese style sometimes. And you just kind of start tossing them into a hot, hot wok with like oil and stuff. And a few minutes later, you have a beautiful, <laughs> you know, pile of fried rice or whatever. And that's kind of his formula. I'm going to go through the steps, but they're not exactly steps. That's what I just want to warn you. So, Don, as I'm reading through these, I think if you have any comments or that, please just stop okay. me. If you, when I get to a step okay. you want to discuss and we'll discuss it. Okay. Okay. So there's no numbers on these, so I'm just going to go through them. Um, first of all, it's vital to have everything prepared, as I just said. What, whilst you'll be writing the thing in three days, you'll need a day or two of setup first. If it's not all set up, you'll fail. Model the basic plot on the Maltese Falcon, or the Holy Grail, the quest theme, basically. In the Falcon, a lot of people are after the same thing, the Black Bird. In Mort d'Arthur, again, a lot of people are after the same thing, the Holy Grail. It's the same formula for Westerns, too. Everyone's after the same thing, the gold of El Dorado, whatever. Mm -hmm. So again, formula, right? Just follow a really basic traditional formula, which I would say that actually quests are another yeah. form of procedural in a way, but uh, they're definitely formula anyway. Because generally, you, there's a procedural, there's a procedure for following a quest, basically. So I'd say they're not exactly a creative procedural, but there, anyway, I, there, there might there be other is, kinds. There is, but I want to save that till the okay. end. <laughs> okay okay we'll get to that then all right Ooh, <laughs> surprise i'm okay so uh next paragraph the formula depends on the sense of a human being up against supernatural force politics big business supernatural evil etc the hero is fallible and doesn't want to be mixed up with the forces he's always about to walk out when something grabs him and involves him on a personal level 
you'll notice again there, as we just said, the hero is being yep. pushed and pulled around by external forces. They're not doing mm. it themselves. They're being blown by the wind. Although it's they're in theory, they're doing it because, you know, they're grabbed at a personal level and they feel they have to do it. But again, it's the external forces that are setting them up. So they have to do it. They they could. I mean, uh, like the Elric stories, the sword made Elric do a lot of things. <laughs> Sounds fine. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. And that makes sense. All right. So you're so again, he's. He's got uh, pushing in elements to the mm-hmm. story that are forcing the hero in the direction he wants. Not that that's necessarily bad. That's not bad at all. But just be aware that the hero yeah. is not doing it out of some great internal need. They're doing it because mm-hmm. the world is pushing them in this direction. All right. Uh, next paragraph. You'll need to make lists of things mm-hmm. to use. That's all it says. All right. Next one. Prepare an event for every four pages. Next. Do a list of coherent images. So you think, right, Stormbringer, swords, shields, horns, and so on. Next, prepare a complete structure. Not a plot exactly, but a structure where the demands are clear. Know what the narrative problems you have to solve are at every point. Write solutions at white heat through inspiration. Really, it can be just looking around the room, looking at ordinary objects and turning them into what you need. A mirror can become a mirror that absorbs souls of the damned, for example. That was actually a Family Guy episode. Yeah, well, they probably read this. Like, well, there was a uh, joke formula. about that with uh, uh, it was Stephen King at his book publisher. Like, wow, Stephen, what's your next book about? Right? It's about uh, and he looks on the desk. This it's it's a haunted lamp, and he picks up the guy's lamp. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. Well, mm-hmm. but you know that kind of works out oddly well. I mean. If you take everyday objects and are turning into right. something horrible, that's what horror writers do, right? You make the familiar unfamiliar right. and therefore threatening or scary. All right, so here's one. The next one is one that I actually okay. really want to talk about for a moment. Prepare a list of images that are purely fantastic, the liberal paradoxes, say, that fit within the sort of thing you're writing. The city of screaming statues, things like that. You just write a list of them so you've got them there where you need them. Again, they have to go here, the right resonances, one with the other. Now, the reason I want to mention this is after reading this formula, I sat down one day. I was, had a little, I was bored, had a little time. So I thought, okay, I'm going to mm-hmm. start writing down paradoxes just for fun, just to, just to create a list of things. Maybe I'll use them for stories. And I found that once I got, a little, got the hang of it, <laughs> not only was I having fun coming up with all these weird paradoxes and that, I mm. actually found it worked as a kind of free writing where I was coming up with all these paradoxes, but they started to cluster naturally right. into story ideas. Like I started to get a sense of, well, what kind of setting or situation right. would have these paradoxes in it? And they made me come up with other paradoxes that fit in within that setting or fit in within that mm-hmm. story that was starting to naturally come in mind. And so it actually worked as an amazing um, form of free writing, basically, for just generating ideas. Plus, at the same time, it reminded me, and I think we mentioned this in one other episode, that modern right. fantasy is often kind of boring. It's really yeah. simple and dull in a lot of cases. Like, there's not that much in the way of fantastic, or weird, or paradoxical elements that are like, mm. what is that? Oh, my God, what's going on here? It's generally the same yeah. kind of plot elements over and over again with maybe a very small sprinkling of original ideas because the authors aren't used to thinking in terms of, like, weird paradoxes or yeah. showing the audience all this weird elements but Moorcock is telling you to do that which I think works great for fantasy maybe not so much good for other things but I think that particular part especially for the fantastic if you're I'm writing like, fantasy it, it kind of works for everything because uh, I've known cartoonists and animators and that that what they'll do is they'll make uh, lists of, of, of things so it'll be like a mad scientist lab what do you find mm-hmm. in a mad scientist lab Beakers, electricity, blah, blah, and they'll they'll do that, you know. Um, uh, '70s cop story. What do you got? Uh, pistols, cars, mustaches, shades, and it's it's the same idea of of you're building a repertoire to draw from, and it helps to put you in the frame of mind of whatever you're doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. No, that and that makes total sense. Um, you it gets you in the frame of mind as you just said, and it. Uh, gets you ready to yep. imagine the world that this character lives in. It's kind of just, it's like prep work. And I think a lot of writers, they want to do as little prep work <laughs> as possible. Well, we haven't, we, uh-huh. no, and I don't mean that in a lazy sense. 
Um, although so often I think it is, but I think for a lot of writers, well, oh, we didn't talk about this really, but generally it's said that there are two kinds of writers. Right. Um, there are plotters and pantsers. With the plotters are ones who plan everything out in great detail. And the pantsers are the people who just kind of sit down and fly by the mm-hmm. seat of their pants, which is where the name comes from. Stephen right. King, for example, is a famous pantser. He literally doesn't plan anything out. He talks about that in his book On Writing, which is otherwise a very excellent book. In fact, it is even if you're a plotter or a pantser, it's worth reading. But he talks about that. He thinks that if he knows where the story is going, it'll be dull and boring, right. which is what many pantsers say. And so they're telling themselves the story, right? And they don't want to ruin it by thinking ahead. So they just sit down and they spend an hour or two writing or adding to what they did before each day. Mm -hmm. And they just kind of slowly pick their way through. And it's a perfectly good way to write. Um, Although I would argue for most pantsers, the truth is there is a story structure there. It's just they've already absorbed it into their head. It's part Mm -hmm. of their psyche, probably because of the media they've consumed. They're still following it. They just didn't bother to plan it out ahead of time. Which, if it works for them, that's fine. Um, Most writers, I think, are somewhere in between. I think a lot of writers kind of fall mostly in the middle where they do a little bit of prep. Maybe they have a rough outline. Maybe they've written a very rough uh, set of characters or whatever. And then they just kind of go to it and they kind of like make it up as they go along. Also fair. Um, The only thing is I have noticed that most of the most prolific and often, sadly, (laughs) the most successful, or maybe not so sadly... Of the independent writers, Mm -hmm. the ones who are cranking out a novel a month or whatever, or sometimes more, they're pretty much all plotters. They're like usually hardcore plotters. In fact, if you listen to them, a lot of them say the same thing over and over again, because I listen to a lot of writer interview podcasts, say the same thing every time, which is, surprise, I started as a total pantser. But then, you know, once I got to my third or fourth book, I found myself plotting more and more. And by the time I got to my seventh or eighth book, I like started plotting everything out in detail before I did. And I wrote so much faster and better than I ever I did before. That. And my first books were crap. Because uh, typically what will happen okay, go. if you're you're writing something, you start with the old adage, write what you know, mm-hmm. uh, write what you like, write for yourself. Right. As your skills develop, mm-hmm. your perceptions of what you're doing change so if i'm writing like a 70s cop story Mm -hmm. and i'm gonna have a car chase and a gunfight and everybody's got the big like porn mustaches and stuff and if if i write like a million of those your brain your brain wanders to other places Mm -hmm. and you'll start thinking well why does everyone have the mustache and then that'll lend itself to something that's a little less surface and a little more in depth of your thing and as you develop, if hopefully mm-hmm. you develop, you start working more in depth and you start asking more mm-hmm. of the, the less obvious questions. And that's why it requires more work because you've now got to think past and think deeper into things. Right. Mm. Mm, makes sense. Okay. That, yeah, that makes sense. And so you're not as resistant. Basically, oh, it's not even resistant. It's, it's just you that before. your ideas themselves get to be more complex and require more attention to fully bring Mm. them out. Okay. All right, so let's continue on with the list then. Uh, Next section. This is another interesting one. Imagery comes before action because the action is actually unimportant. An object to be obtained, limited time to obtain it. It's easily developed Mm. once you work the structure out. That's an interesting approach. I mean, most people would say that the action and the... The actions the character take is important. I mean, but maybe Moorcock's perspective is is that it's more about, again, he's writing epic, massive fantasy here. Yep. That it's more about presenting a fantastic world than it is um, focusing on what the characters are doing. And I think... Because the action's the plot. He's writing the setting. He's not writing the plot. Yeah, exactly. Which, again, if you are writing a story that primarily at its heart is really yep. just about the setting, maybe that's the way to go. Um, (laughs) even if you're writing the Lester Dent, but we'll get to that. All right. Time is the important element to an action adventure story. In fact, you get the action and adventure element out of the element of time. It's a classic formula. We've only got six days to save the world. Meanwhile, you set the reader up with a structure. There are only six days, then five, then four, and finally, in the classic formula anyway, there's only 26 seconds to save the world. Will they make it in time? 
um, which goes down to stakes, which I think, again, are quite important. If your plot doesn't have reasonable stakes, something that's going to make the audience worry yeah. and get emotionally involved with, it's not going to work. And a cheap, yep. easy way to do it is by having time limits. All right, so next one. Uh, the whole reason to plan everything beforehand is so that when you hit a snag, a desperate moment, you've actually got something there on your desk that tells you what to do. <laughs> besides, of course, Lamp the random monster. junk on your desk. <laughs> Next one. Once you've started, you keep it rolling. You can't afford to have anything stop it. Unplug the phone <laughs> and the internet. Lock everyone out of the house. <laughs> um, and don't have pets. That's just my personal thing. Because your pets will demand your attention to pee every right. 15 minutes when you're writing something. Especially dogs. Though we're developing <laughs> pee, walk, food. To take your pick. Whatever it is, it will all have to happen yeah. while you're writing that really important scene. <laughs> All right, next one. Um, you start off with a mystery. Every time you will reveal a little bit of it, you have to do something else to increase it. A good de detective story will have the same thing. My God, so that's why Lady Carruthers Butler Jenkins was peering in the keyhole that evening. But See, where was Mrs. Kind Jenkins? That's important, too. Because um, mm -hmm. it's the reason a lot of sequels fail is because they're not adding anything to the, mm -hmm. to the big picture. And I, that's kind of... That's the key is you always, mm. every scene, every step, add something. Whether it advances the plot, fills out this, the, 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 the setting, or shows another aspect of the character, I think that's the key. Mm, I think so. Every, well, everything has to be showing something. Everything has to be revealing plot mm -hmm. or character. If it's not, it's not doing its job. All right. Next one. I notice again, it jumps around a bit. In your lists... In the imagery and so on, there will be mysteries that you haven't explained to yourself. The point is, you put in the mystery. It doesn't matter what it is. It may not be a great truth that you're going to reveal at the end of the book. You just think, I'll put this here because I might need it later. You can't put in loads of boring exposition about something you have no idea of yourself. I th okay. This seems somewhat self-contradictory. He's telling in your lists, shove in lots of right. imagery that you'll use for mysteries later. But he, at the same time, he says, you don't put in loads of boring exposition mm. that you have no idea about, your, about yourself. But if you're sticking in random stuff to use later yeah, on, you have no idea how you're going to use setting. it. So you'll have, like, say that, mm. yep, you got the mysterious basket okay, seller who smokes this pipe that has this strange green sparkles that come out of it. And who is that guy? What's he smoking? How does that work? I think that's what he's getting at. Right. Okay, that makes sense. All right. <laughs> Next section. This is going to sound familiar. Divide your total. Divide your total sixty thousand words into four sections, fifteen hundred words apiece. Divide each into six chapters. You can scale this up or down as you like, of course, but you'll need more days or stamina for longer books. And keep the chapters at two point five k max, so two thousand five hundred max. In section one, the hero will say, "There's no way I can save the world in six mm. days unless I start by dot dot dot." Getting the first object of power or reaching the mystic place or finding the right sidekick or whatever. This gives you an immediate goal and an immediate element of time, as well as an overriding time demand. With each section divided into six chapters, each chapter must then contain something which will move the action forward mm. and contribute to that immediate goal. So very much like, yeah. as we said, the Lester Dent formula, basically. Um, very often, a chapter is something like attack the bandits, defeat the bandits. Nothing particularly complex, but it's another way you can achieve recognition by making the structure of a chapter a miniature of the overall structure of the book, so everything feels coherent. The more you're dealing with incoherence, with chaos, i.e. with speed, the more you'll need to underpin everything with simple logic and basic forms that will keep everything tight. Otherwise, the thing just starts to spread out into a muddle and abstraction. Again, keeping in mind that he's talking about <laughs> writing this thing in three days in a mad frenzy. Um, next section. So you don't have any encounter without at least some information coming out of it. In the simplest form, Elric has a fight and kills somebody, but as they die, they tell him who kidnapped his wife. Again, it's a question of economy. Mm. Everything has to have a narrative function. Okay. <laughs> next section. Use the Lester Dent master plot formula. Hmm. Uh, he says, this is what he literally says, you must never have a revelation of something that isn't already established, so you can't unmask a murderer who wasn't a character established already. 
All of your main characters have to be in the first part. All of your main themes and everything else has to be established in the first part. Developed in the second and third and resolved that was in the last part. for one reason. And I'm looking backwards. Oh, why so? Because we were talking recently about the original Scooby-Doo. And ev- everybody remembers that every mm-hmm. episode it's ended work. with, you know, the unmasking. It's Farmer Flanagan! Gasp! And recently I rewatched all mm-hmm. of them. And I, I noticed that there's a lot of episodes mm-hmm. that they'll catch, like, the monster and they'll unmask him. And he's not somebody. He's not... The cops will show up and say, oh, this is actually the notorious gem thief, Bob La Bob. And he didn't, that didn't come up anywhere mm. else in the story. And there's a couple of episodes where when they unmask the guy, they never tell you who he is. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if right, the reason the everybody remembers it is it's Farmer Bob is the opposite of what Moorcock is talking about here, that we're climatized to this idea. So we're retroactively imp- printing that Mm -hmm. upon the show even though that's not truly what actually happened in the original show weird huh probably well no we're remembering the dominant formula right we're remembering that the majority of them or what seems to be the majority of them ended that way ah. and oh i was gonna say um sorry later seasons like when you got to the, the 76 season and that started to really follow that formula to to the point that they'd introduce one character at the beginning of the episode and yeah okay I, I think I know who the monster is <laughs> exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah there's only one option so of course it's him <laughs> right all right so uh, let's continue there's only two little sections left um, there's always a sidekick to make the responses the hero isn't allowed to make to get frightened, to add a lighter note, to offset the hero's morbid speeches, and so on. The hero has to supply the dynamic narrative, sorry, the narrative dynamic, (laughs) and therefore can't have any common sense. One of us in those circumstances would say, what? Dragons? Demons? You've got to be joking. The hero has to be driven, and when people are driven, common sense disappears. You don't want your reader to make common sense objections. You want them to go with the drive. But you've got to have someone around who will act as sort of a chorus. So, in other words, you basically have to have someone voice the reader's uh, objections or something like that. Or different things. And, huh? Mm-hmm. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, as, as he says, the chorus. They're there, to abjo- they're, they're there to act as the reader's surrogate and say, Oh my god, that couldn't happen. There are... Um, this was a common problem with old Marvel Comics, mm. actually. Hell, Marvel Comics, I think, still do this. You'll have the guy who's completely shocked because he sees, like, Iceman <laughs> sliding by in his ice slide, going, oh my mm. god, it's someone with superpowers. It's like, <laughs> dude, you live in the Marvel Universe. There are people with superpowers around you every fucking day. Why are you surprised yeah. when you know, a mutant goes flying by? But that character is there to act as a reader surrogate because the reader would go, "Oh my God, it's a guy with it's a mutant well, flying by." That's and a one nice thing. Light. And another thing it does is it helps to um, add to the story while alleviating what we are talking about with like your Law and Orders and your CSIs. That we want to add a more human mm-hmm. touch, a more emotional touch. So we're just going to arbitrarily slap something onto one of the existing characters that may or may not make sense. Whereas it. Right, yeah. That's true. Yeah. And have but if, if you can make a way, sidekick yeah. who's the opposite of the hero, and that way if you want to have one of those stories, you can apply it to the sidekick, and it makes more sense. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, that's true. So you can tell different kinds of stories. Okay, yeah, I can see that. And occasionally sidekicks end up becoming yeah. heroes of their own stories or heroes in their own right. All right, and the very last suggestion he gives, at least this version that, that I've got, says, when in doubt, descend into a minor character. So when you reach an impasse and you can't move the action any further with your major character, switch to a minor character's viewpoint, which will allow you to keep the narrative mm-hmm. moving and give <laughs> you the time to brew something. But again, that's just a way to keep the ball rolling so yeah. you don't hit a writer's block and yeah. stop and not get back to it. Which All of which makes perfect sense, again, if you are trying to write fantasy and you're yeah, trying and to you write know it what fast, else this which is, of course, what Warcock did. This is what I was getting at before. What? He came up with okay. the exact formula and procedure for every role-playing game adventure ever made. 
and it's and it's interesting oh, because right. he's another one like Lester Dent, where the particulars of the character for the story mm-hmm. aren't nearly as important as the structure you're building around them. Which is exactly what a role playing game adventure, right. especially a pre published one, is because you're going to need to fit the player characters into it somehow. Yeah. So they so it doesn't matter who the characters are. They have their character bits and they do the character mm-hmm. stuff, but they have to go through the same plot. So it has to be you're right, it's it's every D D adventure. Well, every adventure module ever written pretty much. Oh, it's for every game, because even at the mm. beginning, when, when he talks about you have to set the scene. The scene is more important than the action. Mm-hmm. In a role-playing game, I want to make the world seem tangible to the players. They're going to provide the action. That's my, not my problem. I don't have to worry about that at all, really. Mm. You know, something I've always wondered. <laughs> we uh-huh. right now got a, a generation of writers, okay, that grew up, many of them, on right. role-playing games, often as game masters. Okay, so they grew up to writing for games, basically, or you know, storytelling for games, and that's what their background is. So you have to wonder sometimes, how does that actually affect their writing? Like, how does that affect the writing in stories that we're getting now? Because they literally grew up on these quasi-generic stories where you just stuck organic character, or sorry, where you just stuck in characters to act as like interesting organic parts of the plot, basically, to run through the story. But the sto- but ultimately the story. It's the mm. setting. It's not really the characters themselves. So I, I've always often wondered if that really affects some of the stories we're getting these days. But but maybe not. Uh, I mean, as we've just talked about, people are putting more and more of the hero's journey into their stories, which is about change and transformation well, it could, and too, is about characters. So who knows, game, right? The, the, your character changing, i.e. Mm-hmm. going up in experience, getting better than that, is a big part of gaming. And I can totally see it because mm, um, one of the tricks that I like to use when I write stuff, I learned from running role-playing games. And that was anytime you have a character, mm-hmm. that character, there has to be kind of, to put it in simplest terms, one thing they're good at. And it's that thing that explains why mm-hmm. they're in the story. That It doesn't have to be like they're, they're right. the massive, Makes wonderfulest sense. guy ever. But this person has to be able to do something that that lets them move forward in your setting in your plot which is how a role-playing game works and then right. everybody should have mm-hmm. one thing that they really suck at they should have one f- at, at one flaw because that's where the drama and the excitement mm-hmm. comes from it's not watching them win it's watching all of the other stuff that they fail at and have to kind of fidget their way through Hmm. That's true. As someone once said, that's why Superman is one of the most boring characters ever created because he has no serious flaws. Because there's nothing fun about a hero afraid of green rocks, I believe was the line. <laughs> Something to that effect, yeah. <laughs> Although, actually, writers do often use one of Superman's yeah. major flaws, which he does. He cares. As they said in Superman 2, mm. he actually cares about these people. Um, and so that's why they use that against him. He, his his mm-hmm. nobility is actually used against him because it functions as a flaw, at least in certain circumstances. And that's why I think the uh, the emo Superman wandering from job to job, it failed not just because of audience expectation, but you're right. That's the big holdback for the characters that he takes everybody into consideration because he's just this like nice guy. Yeah, yeah. He's this very caring individual. At least he's supposed to be anyway. Yeah, and, and that was why, like, in the film, he's just a slacker. And it really kind of... It doesn't fit. And when you take that component out, you're not doing a Superman story. Because mm. cause that changes a major aspect of the character. Right. Even though it looks That's small. like doing a Superman story where he can't fly. Yeah, and, and where he doesn't wear a cape and he fights a giant spider. <laughs> yep, that would be a horrible Superman story. And, and he has long hair, too. He has, yeah. like, a mullet or something. And that almost was a horrible story, is that Superman story, as I recall. Superman Lives, I thought it was called. Was it? I don't remember what it was called. I just remember... That was the one with Nick Cage. <laughs> yeah. 
where Nick Cage was supposed to be Superman, and I think it was called Superman Lives. Oh, yeah. But I'm not sure. Because it got through a lot of rewrites. Fight a polar bear! A what? Why? Really? What? <laughs> yeah, that would be from An Evening with Kevin Smith. That was Kevin Smith's rewrite. It's like, fight a polar bear. Okay. Uh, anyway. All right. So, okay. So those are two of the fairly common formulas. And I think that... Uh, Sorry, those are two examples of formulas for writing, and they're both, as you noted, writing about setting or plot or plot. Mm-hmm. Take your pick. Um, we, as you will note, they're not actually about writing character. Yeah, but that makes them much easier, right? Because writing about people is hard. Because after all, we only really know ourselves, and we think we know the people around us. What? Dun dun dun. <laughs> Uh, but, but I think that's hard for many people. So ultimately people are just writing themselves. And so it's easier if you just have to have a plot and you just kind of plug your ideas into it, I th- whether you're pantsing or plotting. I think the other part of that too is, um, if you remember, uh, when Jeff was talking about the cartoonists he knew, he said they came in two general types mm-hmm. that there were ones who wanted to be a cartoonist. And then they're ones who had a specific story or character that was their thing. Right. And I think that's part of it. Like, um, a good example would be like, say, even the two of us. Mm-hmm. Like, you're a writer. You work to write. Yes. You write tons of stuff. You do stuff. I'm not a writer. I have one story. Hmm. That's true. And I would disagree, sort of. I mean, you have your one story, but you have a huge number of variations of it. Like, you've got a fantasy version of that story, you've got a cyberpunk version of that story, you've got a superhero version of that story. What you do is, you have your story, mm-hmm. but then you play with different genres within that story and setting. It, it Whereas, I like to go between different settings, stories, characters, etc. Like, I like to just enjoy the exercise of writing. It's it's true, but um, even though mine's kind of big, it still follow, it's it still follows, I guess, the same thread. Mm-hmm. And because of that, there's different, there's all kinds of different, uh, I think, perspectives. So like um, the the writer mm-hmm. formulas, which are all basically, every writer formula you're going to see, it's the Lester Dent one with some tweaks on it. Pretty much, yeah. But there's like tons and you collect them like I collect gaming miniatures. <laughs> well, I find them fascinating, right? I'm always looking for different approaches mm-hmm. or for people who did have come up with different perspectives. And there are many of them. Um, they have different tweaks to it. I mean... Yes, as I said, I'll link to them so the audience can go take a look at them. I'm sure probably by the time this episode airs, I will have added probably another five (laughs) or ten of them to the collection. Some of them are actually just like little approaches to writing or little tweaks like uh, Trey Parker and Matt Stone's um, system for making sure you have active characters that are trying to do something as opposed to victims of circumstance. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are a few other weird techniques that I've come across that we haven't discussed and the audience can go through and like, you'll see some of them in mm. on the list. Um, but for the most part, yeah, you're right. They generally almost all come down to one or version or another of either the hero's journey or a procedural of some kind, which is basically something that's focused on the setting or the character going through a series of motions right. that could be almost any character as opposed to um, a hero's journey, which is in theory about that one character. Yeah, and, that, and that's the thing, because like I say, you're collecting to add to your writing ability. Well, yes, duh. Whereas when I look at a lot of them formulas, I find them kind of horrifying because in my mind, when I see the character and the events, they Mm -hmm. play out. Like, I I don't see them as, how can I put this together? I see them as, this is what happened. How can I best present that to an audience to get what actually happened? Okay, well, that's another aspect of writing Mm -hmm. um there are a number of writers and stephen king actually claims to be one of these if i remember right who actually work with the premise more or less that they have a story that's running in their head and they're just trying to get that story out of their head onto the page Mm -hmm. it's almost like they're watching it or on a movie screen or something in their head and so they just simply are transcribing what they see Mm -hmm. there have been a number of writers who claim that that they're basically really just transcribing robert e howard of conan fame actually claimed that he stopped writing conan stories at a certain point and people asked him why and he said conan's just not there anymore yeah like conan basically just kind of 
he he stopped being on the wavelength where he saw Conan and started seeing Cormac McCarn or something instead. And so it's like that's what he started writing. I remember that because he put it that when he writes, I, I think the phrasing he used was, it's as if the man himself is standing at my shoulder reliving his yes. life to me. Mm, relating his life to him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's that's how some writers work. And apparently you're in that camp. I have had that experience sometimes, Mm -hmm. but it usually amounts to a situation where I'm in, where I'll find I'm writing a scene and there's a character and I want the character to do something and the character kind of refuses to do it. Right. (laughs) And to someone who's not a writer, that sounds incredibly weird and kind of schizophrenic. Right. And it kind of is. And I've had people who I've told this to give me really strange and horrified expressions occasionally. But you know exactly what I'm talking about, I can tell. Right. Um, where there are times when the character just doesn't fit with what I'm trying to do with that character. Yeah. Like, really what that is, is it's my subconscious going, you can't do this. Probably for something that you've introduced that you've forgotten about or it doesn't fit with what you're trying to do. And... My subconscious reflects that by basically just refusing to write the character doing that thing, or it keeps coming out wrong when I try to do it. Sometimes I will actually see a scene playing out in my head and I will transcribe it. That does definitely happen. But for me, that's not quite the norm exactly. Mm -hmm. I'm... You could say the scene comes to life through my fingers on the in the text on the page as I'm writing it is often what's happening, as opposed to me like visualizing. It's kind of hard to explain, but it's I think for me it is a little bit different than it is for you. Yeah. But I think most writers have one version of another, or they're different in one way or another. Yeah, because that's the kind of thing I mean. Like I find the uh, the the idea of a, a writing formula horrifying. But if you wanted to mm. ever discuss tricks for, des- I guess you'd say designing a character, mm-hmm. oh, I got tons of that. That's kind of kind of more my shtick. <laughs> well, and we'll get to that one episode too. <laughs> um, I will note that I'm a person um, who has, well, in, as a young youth, I was you know told I had ADHD. Um, Mm. and I've never quite disputed that diagnosis because I do (laughs) to some degree. I, um, you, you can, you can say no, no, and it's okay. No, Um, no, I can't. (laughs) But Okay. Yeah. You've known me long enough to know that I'm the original absent-minded professor. Mm. And some of that's the whole ADHD thing that I tend to hyper-focus. Um, I've developed coping skills and that to go along with it. But one of the weird quirks of that is, is that for me, structure doesn't come naturally. Mm -hmm. And so I seek out structure because I want to use it to focus myself and to keep myself on track and to keep myself focused on things. And so that's probably one of the reasons why I'm seeking out these writing formulas is because I'm, what I'm kind of doing is I'm engaged in building my own structure. I'm not just, I don't just plan to use them. I'm building a structure that works for me for writing stories. Right. Because I crave structure. I crave to have that framework upon which then I use as my canvas to show to uh, produce stories and tell different stories and viewpoints, etc. and things like that. So that's why I don't see them as horrifying. I see them as useful. <laughs> and I would argue that there's many writers that are probably like me, that they need that structure to help keep them on track. It's kind of like just planning out a trip on a road map, right? right. You know, so you're, I need that map. So I can see where all the highways go and then I can kind of plan roughly where I go. And then if I want to plan in detail or if I just want to plan roughly, at least I know where I'm going. It breaks the things down so it makes it easier for me to write and stay on track. See, now that's an important thing too that um, for anybody mm-hmm. like listening who, who wants to be a writer or a musician or, or, or an artist or anything, the trick is to know who you are and what it mm-hmm. takes for you to produce your work. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons why, say for writing, if you want to, to be a good writer, you have to write a lot, not just for the practice, but because that gives you a chance to see, well, how do I write? Yes, that's true. Or develop your writer's voice, as people say. Yeah, and and this is why you want to try different things, is people work differently um, mm-hmm. under different stimuli. Yep. 
and what works for one person does not work for another. Yeah, like I'm... Or can even be detrimental for another. Yeah, I'm, I'm when I do, like, my stuff, I usually got mm -hmm. the headphones on and there's, like, loud, angry, hate-filled music blocking everything out. But that's what it does. That helps me get into the trance by blocking out the world and then I focus on what I'm doing, whereas a lot of people probably could not work under those conditions. <laughs> I couldn't. I mean, I did try once upon a time, but I found that I'm someone who works best under just silence. Mm. But I tend to hyper-focus, so having the music and everything in the background would be a waste for me anyway, and at worst it would be a distraction. Right. So for me, it's best to just quietly be silently sitting there typing or, or dictating or whatever um, the story as it comes to me. And that's the way I work best. Yeah. At least so far anyway. But I have tried. I've tried your music method and everything. And it, if I'm in the mode, it can be helpful. Mm -hmm. But I find for me anyway, it doesn't always work and can even be distracting. Right. So that's why I don't usually do it. I suspect probably if I maybe just played classical music instead, maybe that might be a little better. But again, it would just be functioning as background yeah. noise. And that's the thing that neither way is right or wrong. It's a matter of what mm -hmm. works for you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. And I think that's probably a good um, way to, <laughs> good point to end this conversation on because we're running a little bit long at this point. Mm -hmm. um, one last idea that, oh, I, that I did want to toss in, and this was some, this is some writerly advice that I once heard and has always stuck with me and is something I have to constantly remind myself when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's a very simple phrase that um, many writers often repeat, which is, when you're writing, it's okay to suck. Because <laughs> one of the great enemies of writers is perfectionism. Yeah. You, you think you have to get it right the first time and get it right on the page, and you get frustrated when that's not happening, and you stop, and you stop writing. Mm -hmm. It's better to write several pages of complete crap than it is to write nothing at all. Yeah. And also remember that no one will see this until you've edited the snot out of it <laughs> and rewritten it or whatever anyway. Right. Okay? So if it's complete crap, that's perfectly okay. Don't let that stop you. Michael Moorcock kind of alludes to that in the formula we mentioned earlier. Yeah. Where he says, yeah, just don't stop. Right in the heat of passion. Doesn't matter. And I'm sure that he wrote in his three-day books, he wrote tons <laughs> of crap. And then he went back and edited it. Yeah. Because... As another writer once said, you can't edit a blank page. Right. It's much easier to edit something that's already been written than it is to actually fill in that blank page the first time. True. And so between those two things, it's basically write lots of crap or what could be crap and then edit it into something good. Mm -hmm. And that's some of the best writerly advice I can give, really. That works. So on that note... Thank you, everyone, for listening. Hopefully you found this show somewhat educational. And um, maybe it's just been confusing and annoying. <laughs> That's possible, too. Because uh, we are not structured writers. We are kind of all over the place. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for listening to the show. If you'd like to hear more or join the conversation, come visit us at ObeyTheDNA.com. You can also find us on iTunes or whatever fine podcast site forgot to lock their back door. So until next time, remember that to master the nerdly arts takes time, practice, and enough Coca-Cola to drop a rhino. See ya!
Come on over and join the conversation at ObeyTheDNA.com, where you will find show notes and more.